As I call the meeting to order, which I'm doing now at 5 p.m. on Thursday, March 4th, um, we would like to start um, by respectfully acknowledging that the land on which we are gathering this evening is located in the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Having said that, we will move into our agenda. Um, first, it's, I've done the call to order and roll call. I can see all councillors are present, so I'm not going to go around the table with that. We have everybody present here tonight. So, um, do we want to go? I see there's. Do we need introductions? Else. We have like someone people? else in. The okay, room that's uh, not we'll maybe do a quick introduction yeah. here. So my name is Lori Cranton. I'm the warden for the municipality. Bonnie McIsaac, Deputy Warden, District 3. <laughs> Councillor. Alfred Poirier, District 1, Pleasant Bay, Meet Go, and Chetikam. John McClendon, Wicogama, Wakeaba, River Dennis, Aberdeen, and two sides of the Gainsley. <laughs> Lynn Chisholm, Port Hood, Mobley. Yes. And Catherine Gillis, District 6. Judith to Marble Mountain, Glendale. Yep. All points in between. <laughs> there we go. Okay. We may have to do that again when others arrive, but we, okay. we, we can. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is the approval of two sets of minutes. The first meeting <coughs> minutes are the regular council meeting of February 4th. Uh, motion. These, okay. These have been included in the council package, and um, Everybody should have had a chance to look at them, and I believe we have a motion by Deputy Warden. I do, to approve the minutes for the meeting for February 4th, 2021, as presented. I second. Moved by the Deputy Warden, second by Councilor Poirier. Question? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Yes. <coughs> yeah. All right. I was just given some good advice. <laughs> um, I haven't approved the agenda, so we'll go back Sorry. to that. Um, we don't have very much room with all those presentations to add anything, so I hope nobody's got anything big. I, having said that, I do have one little thing, a letter that's being requested that I sign for, and I'll explain it later. It should only take a couple of minutes. I'll put it under correspondence. Okay. And the reason I'm putting it on the agenda is because it has to be done before Monday. And I'd just like the council to be aware of it. So okay. it's not a big urgent item, but it's, it's, it's time sensitive. So I'll move that the minute the agenda be presented with your addition. Addition. Seconder? I'll second that. Moved. It's been moved and seconded by Deputy Board, <coughs> second by Councillor Gillis. Any further discussion? Question? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, the next meeting was the Committee of the Whole meeting of February 18th, 2021. Has everybody's had a chance to look those over? Are there any errors or omissions? No? Okay. Can I have a motion to approve? Moved by... Alan moved on committee of the whole February 18th. Moved by Councillor McLennan, seconder. Seconder by, by Councillor Chisholm. Any further discussion? Sure. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Motion carried. Stuff. Good. Business arising. Does anybody have anything that's not on the agenda that's arising from there that they feel they need to bring up? Well, since we're having a long meeting, we can wait till the next meeting to okay. for a few items. Sure. That's yeah. simple, it's easier like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, okay. The next item is is an important one, like they all are, but uh, this one is. Um, the uh, meeting we had in Shetty Camp, the Committee of the Whole. Um, the agenda item is the second reading for removal of campgrounds as a permitted use within the residential rural RR number one zone throughout the Shetty Camp plan. So that's the agenda item. Um, I'd like to begin this agenda item by reviewing the steps that council has taken to date on this matter because there's a number of things that have preceded this just to bring everybody up to speed especially in the gallery the planning staff at the eastern district planning commission provided a memo to council dated october 27 2020 recommending that council hold a public hearing following the shetty camp 
at Area Advisory Committee's motion to request the removal of campgrounds as a permitted use in residential rural zone RR1 zone. Okay. The proposed change requires amendments to both Shetty Camp Municipal Planning Strategy and the Shetty Camp Use Bylaw. At the regular meeting of council held November 12th, council made the following motion. The council approved the first reading of the proposed amendment to the Shetty Camp Municipal Strategy of Land Use Bylaw to remove campgrounds as a permitted use. Municipal government the Municipal Government Act requires that an amendment to the bylaw be read twice in order for it to be adopted. A public hearing on the proposed amendment was held in Shetty Camp on the, at 1 p.m. on February 18, 2021. At that public hearing, we heard from residents and have also see, received a number of written submissions which have been circulated to the councillors. Uh, following those submissions, Council has now reviewed all, the provided, all that has been provided on this matter. With that background, at this time, I will call for a motion to consider all submissions that Council has heard and received on this amendment. Um, so I'm asking for a motion, and the motion is to consider, not to approve at this point, but just to consider so we can discuss. So. Do I have a motion to consider the do, Warren, do we need a, we need a motion before I would like to address the, the councillors? Well, this, this is just a just motion. Just a motion to accept the discussion for the motion. Yes. Okay. That's all Thank it you. is. Are Thank you willing you, to make Warren. that motion? Yep. I'll okay. Say. Moved by Councillor Poirier and second by uh, Deputy Warren McIsaac. Um, any questions? Question? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Now we can move on with discussion and I'll give everybody a chance to speak. I hope everybody's had a chance to look over their materials that are <coughs> circulated. Um, it's an important item to the community of Shetty Camp either way, uh, no matter which way we go in this, and it's our responsibility to make that decision in our role as council. So I'll open the floor up and I know Councillor Poirier would like to speak to it. And yep. So uh, you have the floor. Warden Crampton, Deputy Warden McIsaac, Councillors, Staff, Gallery. Uh, first of all, I think as Councillor for District 1, and in particular Shetty Camp area, I think it's my duty to talk on this uh, motion and to talk about uh, the bylaw in the plan for our future uh, for our, our community also I would like to thank all the submission all the, the emails all the you know different talks people talking to me one way or the other I respect that, but it has to come to a point that uh, as a councillor and as a citizen of Shetty Camp for the last 70 years, I feel that I have to bring up a little bit of information that I would like to have all councillors especially, and of course everybody here, uh, to why I came up to this conclusion. I have been following the comments, the complaints, very closely from the onset of the first complaint to Eastern Planning Commission about the campgrounds in Shetica, in Punk Cross. I have also done research on campgrounds in residential areas. I always uh, looked around even outside in Vass County, in Aniganish, and none of them had any of these complaints that have been brought forth. I don't think, and I don't believe, <clears throat> that any of these complaints warrant placing tougher restrictions for location of new 
campground development <coughs> in Shattuckan. All that would do is hinder new development in our beautiful Shattuckan region, which is known for tourism. And by this also, I feel that, uh, you know, of most business people, my age and younger, like everybody here, councillors, we've been struggling. We had fishing, we had lumber. As we can see, cod is gone. Okay, we have now uh, the crabs, which is good. But as a whole, tourism, which I've been part of it with uh, Inverness Musical Coast, with Donna as the, and everybody else here, we've been promoting our communities all across. And I think it's a, it's a good thing because whether we, and another example is an addition, and a big addition into our county, which is the Inverness uh, Golf Course. And it's bringing more people, more people spin off all across. So if we're gonna start being, picking here and there, you know, for certain areas, I don't think it's fair to anybody. So uh, also, uh, if the municipality decides to vote for the proposed changes to the bylaw to approve this, in Shetty Camp we have an advisory committee and we have a zoning from all aboard to bourgeois diesel, which means that it's businesses are allowed to go in, but with very limited and guidelines like anywhere else, you know, it's, so all we are left with is the Shetty Camp back and along the Cabot Trail. So uh, with this bylaw, these changes would definitely need to be in effect for all of Inverness County. And which I don't think Inverness County or councillors or the rest of it, the councillor of Inverness County would be ready to sign a bylaw such as, because I've talked to a lot of people around and they don't uh, feel that Campgrounds, RVs, whatever you want to call it, are not a major problem to the citizens. And I talked to some of them, and I talked to some councillors, and I talked to uh, operators. So uh, this would only lead developers to go anywhere but the Shetty Camp area to develop the new projects which would be detrimental to my area, to Shattuckan. And that would be very unfair. And Mr. Warren, that's why I personally don't agree with the new bylaw. I personally don't want any changes to the old bylaw. I want to stay, the, the county and all councillors to support me to have status quo. Don't move anything, no motion, no nothing, and we will stay with our own bylaw, which we have been doing all along. If there's any changes to be made, you never know. It might come to <coughs> Councillor McIsaac. It might come to Councillor Chisholm. We might have some people that will come in with the same questions. So I think as a group, we should be all on the same note. And I personally hope that I will get the support that we cancel this new bylaw as presented by you, Mr. Warren. Okay. Just want to respond to a couple of things you sure. mentioned there, just for clarity, yep. and I understand where you are coming from, and you're yep. correct. 
when you mentioned this would apply to everybody across the county, this bylaw is only going to apply to the Shetty Camp and the surrounding <coughs> communities. That that's but exactly. what you're saying is it could. It could, it could, but we're not wrong. voting on the other areas. No, now. no, no, no. I know. Yeah, I just want to make sure no, everybody's. Yeah, what that. I was saying, what I meant was that tomorrow or next spring, Bonnie yes. and the councillor, the deputy warden, the Kaisik or yeah. councillor yeah. Lynn could be in the same situation, and then what is happening is that you're taking advantage away from me, from my community, That's and yeah. also from the people that have built Shetty Camp all along for the last 40, 50 years, doing business in Shetty Camp and have their own business. And of course, if you have 20, 15, 25 campers or RVs, it's all people going into Mr. Chicken yeah. here and there. We, we all know about it. So, yeah. yeah. The other, other point I just want to make as well is that beyond this bylaw, whether it's approved or not tonight, yeah. We do have municipally a major job to do and look at its zoning throughout the whole municipality, right. which is going to have rules for every community eventually. Right. We'll have to start somewhere and hopefully get it all done, but we have the province is wanting us, as we know, to look at getting zoning done in much more of our municipality than we have now. And that's not just for us, that's for all municipalities. So that's, that's a whole different topic. Yeah. But so we still, there will still be discussions. Even if this fails tonight, there will be discussions in that area on zoning rules, which could bring this up again, that's right. but that's where it would be brought up. It would be brought up as, as an Inverness County well, a bylaw, it's, yeah. not a Shetty Camp yeah, area that's bylaw. Right. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else like to comment or have anything to say? Well, I'd, I would like to weigh in here. I know each area all has its uniqueness. Yet we're all whole, in a sense, when it comes to things like this as well, with tourism and that. And as Alfred said, whatever we decide, you know it's going to come to your district down the road somewhere. So we have to, have to think what we're, you know, be assured what we're doing. Um, I carefully went over each and every letter, listened to everybody, had a little grid kind of set up as to what I was going to look at and decide upon. So I think I have all the information I need for my decision after studying everything. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else like to comment? I'm not going around the table. I'm just looking no. for comments. No. Councillor McClendon? Uh, I support Councillor Corey and his words. You yeah. said it 100%. Yeah. But uh, like I said, it's one might come up in somebody else's district. And I know I said at the meeting last Last week in Shetty Camp, we have four campgrounds in our area, and there's no problem. And the people that come in, these RVs, trucks, trailers, and that, they're very expensive. So the people are very knowledgeable about camping. And you know, it, it's a, I think the Wicogla district is getting very good campers. They're not loud, obnoxious, and of course on the other end, I was in a few stores on the weekend, well, whatever we had, and they said when it comes to the weekend, their funds go way up. The spending in the stores and whatever, coffee shops, restaurants, they do really well. So I have to <coughs> support Councillor Corey. I don't have to, I will. Thank you. Let me just add to that if I could. Um, our campsite down here, we're good, the sunset, um, our co-op has, it's gone up significantly, unbelievable since the campsite came in, so, and that's just the co-op, there's other smaller, well, it's all small, but it's, it's all gone up, so it's, it's all money in it's the all revenue, you know, so it's Thank you. Anything else, Catherine? Uh, I just feel I have to support the people of Shetty Camp and Mr. Poirier as well, because, at the end of the day, it should be for all of the Inverness County, exactly. not, not to the exclusion of Shetty Camp. So, so, so good. if we have to look at it down the road, sure, but it, has, it should be, the bylaw should be for all areas, not just Shetty Just to put one more thing into the mix, why not? So, I am wondering, do we put in somewhere where it has to kind of look aesthetically pleasing, like if it's up near a road or 
you know, do yeah. we need to put Just trees? Just my quick or, answer on that. Yes. That may come in in a zoning rule or okay. something. Okay. But that's not what this addresses. No. Okay. This is a moratorium on yeah. development, so okay. that yeah. wouldn't really come into play. And that's here. not coming into play here yet, but it will down the road. It could. Somewhere. Yeah. If, right. if, if the community okay. brings that in as yeah. one of the requirements, okay. It it could be part right. of the, the zoning. Okay. Yeah. So that's fine. I'll bring it up then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody else within council? Okay. Now we. I can call for a motion and. I'll ask my legal counsel here if, I, if I'm doing this right, but I can call for a motion to um, approve the second reading and approve the, the, the um, which can be voted down, approve the, the um, bylaw, or if there is no motion to put it forward or seconder, then it's, it's final, it's dead. So is that correct? Okay, so I'm going to call for the motion, and we can still go through the vote. If, if we want to move it and second it, if you feel you'd like to have it on the books that way, um, then we can do that. But if, there's, if nobody wants to make that motion, you don't have to, and then it doesn't go any further. So is there a motion to uh, approve the second reading of the amendments to both the Shetty Camp Municipal, to both the Shetty Camp Municipal Planning Strategy and the Shetty Camp Land Use Bylaw? Hearing any motion? I'm going to call the second time. Is there a motion? I'll even call the third time. Is there a motion? Hearing no motion, I'll declare the matter closed. Final decision. Thank you very much. And I, I thank you for all your work on that. Yeah, if I may, I want to thank everybody, you know, on behalf of the community and myself. And also, uh, that uh, I said it before. You know, I think it's good that we're all unified on the same subject that we look at the bylaws, etc., as a county instead of a community, etc., at this time. So thank just, you again. Just on that note, when we talk about zoning, though, zoning's like, for example, Port Hood here is now zoned. Mm -hmm. The community of Port Hood had a lot of input through a community committee on that zoning process and the rules that are in it. So when we do zoning, we'll be going to various communities. Right. Where I live in Marguerite is not going to tell Shetty Camp how no. to zone their backyard, right. or Absolutely. vice versa. See, we already have zoning, eh? Yes. In some places. Yes. You know? like yeah. there. But then after that, you're in the open. You and know? zoning can be changed, too. Yeah, that's right. right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Can be reviewed. and. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have a lot of work to do All right. in the future on zoning, for right. sure. And we'll be up to the task at the time. Okay, thank you everybody for all your hard work. We went, I think we handled this very diplomatically yeah. and well, and we went through all the procedures and did all our due diligence, and uh, I respect your opinion and your decision as board. Okay, uh, notice of motion, and I'll ask... Um, but for the amended sidewalk maintenance policy, which was in your package. And I will ask our Christine uh, Murray to um, give us her, I think you were going to give us some background on that. Sure. Thank you very much, Warren Crane. Um, so in your council package, you have an amended sidewalk maintenance policy. At the Committee of the Whole meeting on February 18th, uh, the current policy was in your council package and council discussed that. Um, and as a result of council's guidance and direction as to how to amend that, uh, we have amended the sidewalk maintenance policy. Um, the big changes now include um, that uh, sidewalks are to be cleared no later than 24 hours after a storm event, whereas um, the, the current policy says, 70, says three days. Uh, and we've also included um, that um, it will also occur on weekends and holidays, um, and that uh, the sidewalk, the policy also applies to clearing fire hydrants, yes. um, which wasn't in the other one. There are some other changes as well, but those were kind of the big ones. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions or concerns you might have after reviewing the, uh, the policy that's in, the, in your council package. Anybody have any questions? 
You're I, smiling over there. <laughs> I, I'm just smiling because I'm just very happy for this. Me too. <laughs> okay. Very was, happy, especially after the last week. Yeah. It's been pretty, I'm not saying anymore. Just very pleased. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Warden Craven, if I may. Yeah. Uh, so this is a bit of a, a, an odd one to have the notice of motion at the regular <coughs> council meeting. Normally the notice of motion goes to the committee of the whole. Um, but at our committee of the whole meeting, council directed that it be brought back because it is a timely issue. Yes. Um, and now our policy requires that the notice of motion be put before council at least seven days before it's voted on. So at this stage, um, I would recommend that um, a recommendation be made to approve it at the committee of the whole meeting um, oh. because if, backwards from what we usually yeah. do. backwards from what we usually do um, because if we if we go through a regular process where the notice of motion would occur in Mar at the March committee of the whole meeting it wouldn't get approved until April right and then we're pretty much almost yeah. done with yeah. right. so it's it's a bit of a change. there still be snow in the Highlands. <laughs> I'll send mine down to you. I, I just wanted to know it's a bit of a change from our regular process, but uh, that's you know, okay. Well, that, that makes Whatever good sense. Works. It sure does. Yeah. Yes. So I'm looking for a motion to uh, approve to Perfect. recommend this for approval at our committee, upcoming committee of the whole meeting on the what's the date of it? The 18th. 18th of. I up. am moving that. You're second to that. I guess. sure am. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. We have Thank you. Deputy Warden yeah. McIsaac is making the motion, and Councillor Chisholm is seconding it. Any further discussion? Question? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. I think that's a job well done. Lovely. Well, sure. a very positive Wonderful. change. It is. It's going to help many people. Yeah. We get those storms. Now it's going to rain the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I'll lose all my snowmobile. And thank you to all the staff for getting yes, that together in a timely yeah. fashion. For sure. for sure. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next item is Police Board uh, Municipal Policing Priorities. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe who was going to speak to that? Keith? Well, that's the uh, meeting that we just had in Shitty Camp. Uh, this item was on our agenda just to uh, uh, ask that the various counselors and um, review what policing priorities may be in their district and bring uh, one or two priorities back to the table today uh, so that a comprehensive uh, submission can be made to the RCMP detachment uh, so that they have a good understanding of where uh, the Municipal Council would like to see the focus of their membership over the, the next uh, uh, fiscal year, so April to, to the end of March. So if, uh, if the idea was the warden would go around the table and get some feedback from each one of the, the councillors um, on this item, as well as the warden to provide some feedback either one or two and if there's more uh, priority areas that they'd like to see in policing that uh, then we can package that up and send it along to the RCMP. Okay I'll start with Councillor Gillis. Uh, the only thing that I would like to see is maybe more of an enforcement of the speed zones in our district. Okay in your district like the Route 19 yeah. a lot of it and <laughs> everywhere. Marble Mountain. Marble Mountain. The back roads. <laughs> okay. They're not really back roads, but they feel like back roads. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah okay, so um, speed is, is an issue um, in, in town. I've had a couple of um, calls about speeding within the village. Um, I'm not going to say what street it was, or I'm not calling anybody out, but speed is, a, is, a, is an issue. Um, one of the biggest issues here, uh, and I, I know this for myself, is just young drivers speeding and, and just all night long, up and down the road, and doing wheelies and donuts. Just like I used to do. It's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, and I don't know how you, uh, how you could possibly Stop. control that unless you're sitting in the spot 24-7, right? I mean, summertime is your biggest problems, and that's everywhere, not just poor mm -hmm. good, but... Yeah. Yeah. And it's a concern, and it riles people <clears throat> up because it's a worry, and, you know, so that, that's two, two items that are probably 
pretty general around the table here. Mm -hmm. Okay. John. Uh, the only complaints I really heard was uh, was speeding in uh, two areas. And I went to see the well, Steve and S RCMP I went to see and they they were going to put out a couple of more patrols and then the Portage Road when it's completely paved. I went to see the RCMP in Hawkesbury and I never got a complaint since they they followed up on it on complaint, they called me back and I guess they just drove the road a little extra. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than that, we have an RCMP officer stand in Wakagama which helps quite a bit, and of course we have a RCMP station in Wakeabout, which is pretty well manned, it is manned all day, and then they'll come down in the evening, stay for a couple of hours, and then move on. But no other than that, it's really, it's the speed, and like uh, Councilor Chisholm said, if you call the RCMP, they're maybe half an hour away, and you really can't catch the person. Yeah, so. it's tough. But other than that, they're doing a, they're doing a good job. Okay, Councillor Poirier. Uh, well, <laughs> it's like everybody else. Speeding is the the thing, but uh, you know it's so hard to uh, you know to solve this problem. Is I was thinking what everybody else was saying. It's just that uh, one time I was I got home and then five minutes after my wife came home and she said, "Did you see this guy zoom or you know pass me?" And I said, "No, I never did." You know, so how do you catch these people? You know, and it's so hard for them. The RCMP. Yeah. The only thing that I have, we have, I had a perfect, and I like everybody else, good connection, good conversation, good communication with them, and when uh, it's good be on the agenda that we're talking very seriously is the, at the post office with the amber light because this oh, is the, you know we've been talking about but it's not the RCMP but the, we <coughs> so that's the only conversation I had. Mm -hmm. Wait for my list. I think got a list. <laughs> I usually do. You're allowed one or two. Oh okay well um, everybody else has speeding so I'll, I'll just uh, sit yeah, right up there piggyback on that. Uh, cell phone use behind the wheels. I think that could be, you know, looked at. And um, impaired driving. I noticed uh, with the RCMP statistics that were given out at the last uh, RCMP advisory board meeting, Inverness is pretty high up there for impaired drivers in the Inverness district. And I had mentioned at that time when they asked, and I thought impaired driving, like, uh, uh, check stops, not, you know, at 9 or 11 o'clock at night, but maybe 5 or 6 in the evening or somewhere around there might be more applicable in some cases. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and, uh, you know, I think, I think more could be done on uh, the drug situation as well. I don't think uh, we're oblivious to knowing that, you know, there, is, there are issues in Inverness County with that as well. And I think um, maybe they're working on it. I don't know, but I'm sure they are. But uh, I'd like to see more, more time being put on that as well. Okay. For myself, um, I've got one that I keep hearing about every day. And it's a particular area through the Marguerite from what I'll call Doyle Road okay. to what we used to call the Creamery or Cody Road at Marguerite where you go by the co-op store mm -hmm. and it's a fairly busy active area there and a lot of traffic. It's the only big traffic area in the Marguerite's pretty well. But people are driving 80, 100 kilometers an hour coming in that and they don't let off on the gas pedal coming through. Um, there's been a number of accidents, near accidents. I get complaints. Transportation did put some, up some extra speed signs and stuff like that. But the only thing that's going to control that through that area is a few people getting caught doing what they're doing and I'm not I have no names or anything like that yeah. um, and but I'll probably be the first one caught <laughs> no that um, wouldn't be good don't put that in the paper but anyway um, I it's a, it's a, it's an I have I have one or two people that are really seriously concerned that call me on a monthly basis so if there's an area where they could do some extra patrols it would be be in, in that area. Um, so that's, 
that's the, the, the biggest one and just general being in the area like we're kind of off the beaten track and in the rural communities there so we may we're not going to see them up and down the road like you would in Inverness or Shetty Camp so maybe a few more patrols um, it's funny when someone when the RCMP come through Marguerite and they go buy a store or something it's almost it's everybody's on their phone saying oh, cops yeah. are in town yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so they That's can't get away word. with it but the more it, it I'll tell you it really affects how people operate right. not just cars mm -hmm. but how they behave yeah. when they know the police are around mm -hmm. And uh, more of that, I think, would curve some of the I think bad that's habits. a small town thing. When people are texting, they don't realize, though, the repercussions that could have. Yeah, some kid could die on the road because they uh, drunk at them that didn't right, stop. Right, exactly. You know? yeah. So um, I, I see that as one. But the one at Marguerite Forks is one that um, they could really stop, do some checks there. I know they do some some late later night checks there quite often there and at Marguerite Harbor for impaired driving quite often, and they have been quite successful with that. I know a number of people have been charged. Um, but that speeding through that area, someone's going to get killed. Yeah, if right. they, one th and one thing, and I don't know how we can do it, like Hagama, for example, they have that sign that gives you your speed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is something, the municipality with the RCM could, and transportation we could work toward. I'd love to see us have two of those so we could put them in Mabu at one end and the other for a while. Mm -hmm. And once they're there a while, they say they're not as effective, mm -hmm. but then move them to Marguerite, move them to Craignish, move them, move them around. So, because I'll tell you, when you come through on the Trans Canada Highway, through Wakeabad and Waikagama and stuff, and you see that sign flashing, you first mm -hmm. thing you do, you look at your speedometer mm -hmm. and you slow down. It catches me every time. It's conditioned. And it's a condi yeah. yeah, and uh, it makes a difference. And, I don't know if the municipal, I don't even know what they're worth. I know they're not cheap because they're radars and mm -hmm. power needed and all that. I think it's a permanent one in Waikagama now. Yeah, there's yeah. two of them. So something we should explore, I think, down the road as a, mm -hmm. as a municipality, maybe having those, a couple that we share around the various communities in the municipality. And maybe we can find, uh, I'll throw that out to Melanie if you ever hear of any funding that may be <laughs> out there for something like that. But. Um, uh, it'd be nice to have someone partner with us because we've got limited dollars right now with all the other things we've got going on, but uh, hmm. that might uh, might be a, a way to curb people's, um, you know, speeding and stuff like that. So the that's all I have. The Glenville, we can stick one on each end yeah. there. Yeah, but you move it around. Every, yeah. You might, a month here, a month there, makes a difference, saves a life, that's worth Absolutely. every penny. Absolutely. Yeah. Right on. You got all that? CAO? I do too. Yep. Okay. We got it on record. We got yep. it on record. Perfect. <coughs> um, go on back on my agenda here. Yep. Okay. Um, next one is $2 billion trees in Inverness County is going to plant in the next few years. About $2 billion. Trees. <laughs> $2 billion. Did I say $2 million? million? You said $2 billion. Dollars. Of trees. Okay. <laughs> No, the, uh, we have a, a, a program here from Canada's uh, Growing Canada's Forest Program, and um, it's an information piece that was sent out, but uh, they're looking for future participants by the deadline of uh, May 27th, 2001, 5 p.m. Um, Natural Resources Canada is looking to engage those interested in growing Canada's forests as a nature-based solution to support national climate and climate and national climate change actions, and we all know trees help with our climate and our, and all those good things. So, is that something we are interested in participating in? And if so, I think we have to express our uh, interest. And there's you can request more information. So I would suggest we request the more information and keep abreast of what's going on and taking it from there. Yes. Does that sound like I don't think we need a motion to do that. We're not spending any money yet. No, but uh, in particular with the Strathorn Tree Nursery within the boundaries of Ernest right. County, uh, that facility has a significant opportunity to play a ma major role in uh, responding to this. Um, among one step we could have is have uh, representatives from uh, the facility possibly give council an update on what they're working on or if council would like uh, maybe a tour of the facility 
either or or, um, and also another option is to uh, send a, a letter to the department uh, to find out what potential applications they may have uh, going towards this federal program and, and see if there's a way the municipality may be able to support uh, their applications. Yes. All good ideas. Yes, and they, I think they have a deadline of May, March 25th there in the uh, package. So, yeah, I, I think that's great. Yeah. So, do you want to follow up with some of that, Keith, or your staff? Sure, yes, whatever. I'd say, do, let's do it. Whatever's so, easiest. Uh, meet, I would like there to have a tour, at, too. Like, yeah, I and we, then they could do the, they get lots of yeah. space there. They could do their presentation. They could do the presentation. Mm -hmm. And give and us a tour. Do it before their deadlines, whatever they Maybe need, in the spring so. sometime, a little bit when it's... Well, they have a deadline here of March 25th, so if they need us I saw before May then, 27th. What am I seeing? I don't know. I'm on this yeah, page. May 27th. Deadline May 27th. Tuesday, May 27th. Yes, yeah, so we do have some time. Future yeah. participants on the first page. Oh, okay, and they have May, March 25th on another page there. Oh, yeah. I think if they wanted to present to us, yeah. they wanted to come in, and then we could do a tour later. Yes, yeah. or do both at the and same time. And once we do that yeah. and see where they are, then if it helps, we could write our own Minister of mm -hmm. Lands and right. Forests and projects. see if they would partner with us yeah. with our nursery. Right. In, 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 a, in a program that would be beneficial to yeah. the county. No, that's fine. I see that one there. So. Okay, the next one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, right. any, any questions on that or other mm -hmm. comments? No. Okay. Um, Port Hood, okay, recommendations. And I just got to get my recommendation yeah. list here. And we're going to do this like I did last time. I think it really made things go it a helped. little faster. Um, you should have you guys gotten a copy of the recommendations from our COW meeting? Should be in on paper probably. <coughs> Did that go oh, yeah. yeah. It's number eight recommendations on top of it. Okay. Um, so so Here's where we are. Um, a is Port Hood and District Recreation Commission uh, repainting and lighting upgrades. Uh, the current re, uh, request is for ten thousand dollars, and that that council funds and the the recommendation is that council funds this request in full in the following manner: District Five is four hundred ninety-two fifty. Um, from regular fund or from yeah the municipal what do we call that CDG CDG development. community development grants and under the discretionary in in that district the same district as well is thirty five hundred dollars so that would be through district five district six is three thousand nine hundred ninety two dollars and the rec Creation facility grant of two thousand fifteen dollars for I believe a total of ten thousand is it? Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we've we've recommended we fund through those various uh, funds available to us um, the full ten thousand um, dollars. Do I have a and we've already gone done the discussion on this. So do I have a motion to approve the recommendation? I move that we approve the recommendation. And maybe read that first sentence there. That the current request for ten thousand dollars from District Five Community oh. Development Grant, District Five Discretionary Fund, District Six. Oh, you don't have. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I was just talking the first sentence there. Oh, sure. Uh, that the current request for the Port Hood and District Recreation Commission repainting and lighting upgrades. Um, okay, for ten thousand. For ten thousand. Yeah. A second to that motion? Awesome. Seconded by um, <laughs> Councillor Chisholm. <laughs> brain, brain kick again. Um, sorry about that. Um, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, <coughs> B is Shetty Camp Amber Light. And the recommendation is that a letter be written to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal requesting an amber light be installed at this location. 
the Cabot Trail near the post office is the location, that intersection. Yeah. Right there at the fire hall. That's right, yeah. yeah. Okay. You want to make that motion? Yeah, I so move that we send a letter to the Minister of Transportation for the to install an amber light at uh, Crossroad or at uh, by the post office and uh, the Kemetieu, which is uh, a very busy area. So yes. I move that. Uh, okay. We so move I have a second on that. Seconded by Deputy Warden McIsaac. It was moved by Councillor Fourier. Any further discussion? Question. Question. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. C, meeting invitation. NS, to invite NS, the representative from transportation and, that, and infrastructure renewal will be invited to a meeting of council to late line the proposed changes at the Pearl Hawkesbury Rotary. And before, I just have a little to add to that. I had a lengthy conversation with the mayor in Port Hawkesbury, Mayor Ben DeShiz and Beaton, and uh, about the Rotary, and they've been involved somewhat with TIR as well, maybe even a little more than we have been, even though it's in the municipality. But they are working with um, Cape Britain Partnership, and they would like to make sure we're in Paris, part of the picture, to, and, and some of the other municipalities, as looking at what else can be developed around the Rotary. That's when you drive into Cape Britain, that's the first thing you're going to experience. So they want to see that there's places for people to park, take pictures, maybe get some history, the tourist, the tourist bureaus there, all that kind of stuff. But you don't want to be doing that after they build the Rotary. You need to get it into the plans and transportation has told them that. So fine to go ahead with this. I think we need to be updated on that plan. But there is an invitation from the town of Port Hawkesbury as well to join forces with a number of other um, Cape Britain um, people to, to make sure the right things happen there. So I would suggest we join those forces as well. Council Mr. Warren, Warren, <clears throat> is there any, yourself, you know, as warden or anybody else from council or the staff on the, you know, the Pudoxbury with the mayor and then everybody else in the partnership. I think, you know, I said it two, three times and, uh, you know, uh, the Causeway is in Inverness County, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we don't want more than anybody else, but we don't want less, you know, and there's a good way, you know, that, uh, you know, if... Uh, I've expressed that to them. Yeah, that's right. And we, if there's a, a committee we should be first there. We should be first there. And uh, we got to make sure that we look after the 105, Waikagama, all around Route 19. we got to look after ourselves, you know, because, uh, you know, we, uh, it's, it seems, what bothers me, it seems that everybody else seems to be talking about the causeway and the causeway, and they take over the causeway, but basically we don't have a say to it so yeah. it just that that's just and, my uh, and, and and in their defense yeah um and i didn't know this was going no, no, on no, at the no, time no. but in their defense they said you, you guys have to be at the table right. that's right. Was that an invite? Invite? yes well yes. not really it's just it's very new right. so yes. but we're supposed to have there's supposed to be a meeting brought together and i think uh uh cape britain partnership is working and involved with it as right. well i'm going to talk yeah. to yeah. Talk to it's them. like having a, like an archway into, yeah. into Cape Breton. It's, it's the, yeah, it's the opening point to Cape Breton Island. Yeah. So all of Cape Breton, and because if we can focus it that way, I think mm -hmm. the funding that could be available, because it's part of a bigger picture, right. um, I think that's what they're looking at. They it can say to government like, for funding that we have to do this right. right, now is the time to do it, and these are the things that need to be put in place yeah. for the Rotary to be what it really should be right. for welcoming people into Cape Britain Island. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that's where the conversation is yeah. headed. That's good. Um, yeah. And I will be following up on that. Thank you. To make sure yeah. that it's happening sooner and later because transportation doesn't want to find out after they finished yeah. all their plans that we want to change things. They're not right. going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. They can tell that. So right. it's timely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, <coughs> so, okay. Uh, I move that the meeting invitation be extended to the Nova Scotia TIR representatives, re the Port Hastings Rotary, 
and that the representatives from Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal be invited to a meeting to outline the proposed changes at the Port Hastings Road. Thank you for the motion. Moved by Councillor Gillis, second by Councillor McClendon. Any further discussion? Questions? Question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Um, okay. Um, there's next one D is meeting invitation for GFL levels of service that a representative from GFL Green for Light be invited to an upcoming meeting of council to discuss the service that they are providing. Um, just a note on this one, um, as recently as the day before yesterday, I linked, or, or not, or the day before that maybe, I had a call from Jeff D, is it, Warden, or uh, CAO? Yes. Jeff D, who is the manager in any condition for GFL, wanting to meet with just me, and a little apprehensive of meeting with everybody else, and I, he wanted to just sit down and go over what, where they are with things, and I said, I am inviting our CAO at least at this meeting, and I was going to further follow up on meeting with council, but to meet because uh, our CA and probably our 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 um, like Aaron Gillis, Aaron Gillis to to be involved as well, um, and he's never been very involved in discussions from what I gather from the CAO and stuff like that, and when I brought up that I wanted other staff there, he kind of hedged back a little bit, so he was looking, I think, to go above and beyond to someone maybe that doesn't know as much, is not as knowledgeable as staff are about the process. That's the feeling I got. But anyway, we were going to have to move the meeting because of meeting with the minister earlier today on Zoom. And then he said his, his he was going to bring his regional manager from, any, from Port Hawks, from Halifax in, but because of COVID, that was proposing a problem. So. And that was never mentioned before, but anyway, he said, we'll just do it at a later time. So I'm going to go we'll go ahead and invite him to a council meeting, which I think with Aaron Gillis and, and our CAO here as well. And uh, um, I'm going to we'll extend that form of invitation and see what happens. Um, uh, can I just say yep. something? Uh, today, uh, the uh, guidelines for Halifax and area changed the COVID regulations changed. So there is Better. enough restrictions, a little bit, so okay. maybe he doesn't have that excuse anymore. Yeah. I mean, you can always put on a mask like everybody else. Everybody else, else. Can exactly. I say something? Um, I think it's important that they come in here to yeah. speak with council because I know of other like complaints and just in the last couple of days I've gotten, I'm starting to get complaints. Yeah. I haven't had them before. Uh, and I was a bit surprised, uh, but I, I know that in Malmo there's been a few complaints only in the last two days. So I think it's important that, he, that they speak to councillors because we are we are the ones getting the messages from the people. We are so. Yeah. yeah At least I, to share them, and I'm sure staff yeah. are getting some. Absolutely. As well. yes. Um, yes. I, I seem to have the most issues with their service levels or the non-existent service levels in most cases. So I really feel he's trying to avoid. Confrontation there. Well, getting his feet held to the fire. Yeah. So I would no. prefer that they. We have a contract there and they yeah. have to live up to it. Yeah, we have an option to renew or not renew. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, yeah, I agree. So, with I'll follow up with our CAO and we will invite mm -hmm. him to a meeting of council. I'll give him a few dates mm -hmm. and tell him not to worry. But if, if the, his, his person in Halifax wants to zoom into the meeting, we can arrange that too, right? And, and like you mentioned before, we would like to fix this before the review comes up, basically. Let's fix the problems. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So. Absolutely. Yeah. It can be positive. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So basically, um, <laughs> this D, um, if someone wants to make a motion, um, it, it actually says what we're going to do. Uh, I move that we extend the invitation to GFL uh, regarding their service levels and that the representative of GFL be invited to an upcoming meeting of council to discuss the service they are providing. And I will second that motion for you. Okay. It's moved by Councillor Gillis and seconded by Deputy Board McIsaac that we invite GFL to a council meeting. Any further discussion? Question? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Um, number or letter E there is IT upgrades yeah. cloud-based server council approved funding for IT 
upgrades to a cloud safe base server with funding coming from COVID safe restart funding to a maximum of $15,000. And we discussed that uh, with our CAO. So you want to make the motion? I do. The council approve the funding for the IT upgrades um, to a cloud based server with funding coming from the COVID safe start restart funding, safe restart funding to a maximum of $15,000. So it's moved by Councillor McIsaac, second, second, Deputy Warden McIsaac, sec, seconded by Councillor Chisholm. <laughs> trying to talk too fast. <laughs> it's all good. Um, any further discussion on the motion? Question? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Um, charitable F is charitable exemption, Wicogama Development Commission. The recommendation is that Ralph's, the former Ralph's Dairy property in Wicogama identified as assessment account number 02249103, which is currently owned by Wicogama Development Commission, be exempt from taxation as a charitable exemption pursuant to section 71 of the Municipal Governance Act. Area rates and fire protection rates will still apply to this property. So. Does someone want to make that recommendation? I'll make that recommendation. Okay, we have the wording. Then we have uh, the charitable exception yeah. Wicogma Development Commission that the former Ralph's Dairy property in Wicogma identified this assessment account, num account number 0224-9103, which is currently owned by the Wicogma Development Commission, be exempt from taxation as a charitable exemption. Pursuant to Section 71 of the Municipal Government Act, area rates and fire protection rates still apply to the property. Do I have a second to the motion? <coughs> or whoever. Oh, no. Second by Deputy no. Warden. No, sir. By Councillor Poirier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any further discussion? Motion. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. And the last one, approval of public. Yes. Which Five one? Number eight? Number eight. Or G? G. Yeah. Bring it. We want to bring come back to that later? Yeah. If that's okay. In that other meeting? Or? No, this meeting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You have to get some more information. I, I, something should have been included in the Council of Action. It's not there. Okay. So, so we're going to we're gonna come back to that one when okay. our when um, our legal counsel provides us with some more information. Okay. Okay. So we're going to move on. Um, Correspondence. Um, I just had a call just yesterday from the Legion, who, um, and, and Councillor Poirier may be able to enlighten us a little bit about the background here, but um, Chester Muse, who is a military background, served most of his life in the military and then held another or other leadership type jobs. He's been working very hard within his retirement years in the community of Shetty Camp. One of the big projects I've been involved with them right now is the Meals on Wheel program, where they're delivering 40 meals a day through the Micaram Center where they're producing the meals. Very good program. They had to move it because of COVID out of the nursing home to Micaram where there wasn't the residence that it was, just wasn't a good place to have it during, during COVID. And there's a look, they're looking at keeping it there. But the short of the, the long story short, the Legion and I believe another organization as well there, I'm not sure who, but Councilman Kinsman, Kinsman, Kinsman yeah. are wanting to nominate him for uh, the Order of Nova Scotia. And they've asked me if I, they'll help break the letter with his background, but. Um, they asked me as warden if I would sign a letter supporting that nomination. I said, without talking to council, you have my blessing, but I'll talk to council first just to make sure they're aware and approve of my signature on that. And uh, they have, the reason I had to put it on, they have to have this in by Monday. So the next couple of days, I should be getting it. I hoped I'd have the letter to read to you tonight, but I don't. Um, so <coughs> anything you want to add to that, Councilor for you? Well, I tell you what, it's, it's all clusters, you know, when the COVID-19 started, you know, and uh, 
I know myself as counselor, he was a big help, you know, with uh, the different groups, the Legion, the, the Community Matters, the Kingsmen, and, uh, you know, even uh, Papa Noel, <coughs> Christmas Daddy, we used to pick up around five, six thousand. This year we took it over and he decided that he was going to make it big, so we raised about six. I shouldn't say we, he raised, or they raised about $16,000. So everywhere that he touched were pretty well successful, plus very devoted to the community, to the seniors, to the less fortunate, you know, so it's... Uh, I met with him a couple of times, I totally got that sense. Right. Yeah, yeah. How many years, Alfred, like in general, just like a long time? Uh, so he's been at it, I think, I would say he would have been retired now about eight, nine, ten oh, okay. years. But he moved but, back to Shetty Camp recently. Yes, but uh, what, what happened is that when they used to go to Florida every year, and this year, and uh, the year before they were here, and then when COVID started, he started, and he didn't stop since, you know, so, uh, and they didn't, they're not going to Florida, so he kept on going on, on different, you know, issues for the seniors, the, the, and uh, Meals on Wheels was about 24, 25, and I think it's up to 41, 44. Yeah, they're up, they're up yeah. over 40 people. They opened it. They doubled it. Saw the yeah. Yeah. They bought it. He, he got them probably $100,000 worth of new equipment in there. Yeah, yeah. And he got funding for it. So they got all new refrigeration stuff. Yeah, and, and they, got, uh, they got, with the community matters, 750 bags, 10 pounds of potatoes, you know. That wow. I delivered from Meat Cove, Pleasant Bay, and all through Santa Camden went. Also, we always got some frozen stuff, fish, etc. And well, you name it, you know, he's everything he touched turned to yeah, gold. Yeah, yeah, you can. I can't, just, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't say some more, and I know I'm missing it. Yeah. Yeah. No, so no, no yeah. he's got a good reputation. So, yeah. if, is is do we need a motion to approve that? I wonder. It doesn't hurt. <coughs> yeah, it doesn't hurt that motion, I guess. Just a motion for the warden to sign a letter of support. Yeah, for I, yeah. I would uh, move okay. that to, we sign a letter, of, letter support. of support for the nomination of Chester Mewes for the Order of Nova Scotia. Okay. Seconder? Second by Councilor McClellan. Any further discussion? Question? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Well, we're into, are we early here? Probably. Oh, yes. We still have the Cape Breton Creative Sector team. Mm -hmm. We do. Number 10. Did I miss one? Well, we oh, have it's the next one. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. Correspondence cable. There it is, right here. Okay. So, discussed this a little bit before the meeting with some of the staff. <coughs> They're basically looking to obviously inform of have their, uh, have their work. And uh, I think what they are wanting is the opportunity to come present to council. And uh, from what I see, we, we turn nobody away from council within the municipality that makes sense, and uh, likewise for them. And so I've asked our staff, uh, <coughs> he's going to uh, communicate with them and invite them to an appropriate council meeting when it could be scheduled and let them come in. And, I don't think they're off asking for any money at this point, really. They want our... Yes? Uh, Donna, Donna. Oh, Donna? Sorry. Yeah. OK. I just wanted to add, I was talking to uh, Lisette Bushlaw, who was yeah. on the um, team. And she's indicated that they're, they're now um, discussing the possibility of doing a Zoom uh, meeting with all municipalities on the Breton Island. Okay. So I, I just I don't think set a date or anything like that. that might be coming up. I just wanted to let you know that okay. possibility. If that suffices for them, we'll, we'll yeah. participate. Yeah, I think it would be easier instead of them presenting at each at the five. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, and you can pass that on if they want to meet with us. We will be able to entertain that, or if they have another process like that. Would be willing to participate. Okay. Is everybody comfortable with that? Absolutely yeah. perfect. I think they'd still like you to respond to their letter just to yeah, that, well, that you do yeah, hey, can you um, support them. Thank you. I like it when you can turn to staff and say you do. That's really key job. It's one of the rare moments in this job. It's not really my place to do that. Uh, 
Um, okay. So we can uh, we can take a quick uh, recess and have the presentations set up. Yeah. And uh, how far how far ahead of schedule are we? We're a little bit. We can have a uh, community welcome group up next after a short okay. recess. We can move the projector in place and get everything set up for yes for that. Yeah, we could do, we have a little meal for council and stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah. Do we, do we want to do number 11 just to get that off the yeah, plate? The next meeting date. The next meeting date is uh, number 11. The so next meeting date would yeah. be Thursday the 18th of March for CO meeting yeah. here. Yeah, at 9.30. At 9.30 in the morning. A.M. Perfect. So the next regular council meeting is on uh, April 1st. And April 1st would be April 1st. A for food. Yeah. Oh, that's going to be a fun one. <laughs> well, I have a story Don't for you guys. Don't even bother. <laughs> I'm telling you now. <laughs> Thank you, folks, for the meeting so far, and we'll hear from our presenters. April 1st at what time? Oh. 3 o'clock. Uh, 3 o'clock. We'll introduce. We'll introduce. We'll introduce. Okay, folks, we're going to come back to the table. Feel free to bring your tea and coffee and snack with you. We can, as long as you don't chew too hard, Don will still be able to be heard. <laughs> um, so, we're going to go to the last of the presentation list, um, number 15, Community Welcome Groups and our recreation person, Don McDonald, Tourism, Recreation. Tourism and Culture. Tourism and Culture, got it. Is going to make the presentation. Thank you, Don. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so we're here to introduce, um, you may have already heard of the Newcomer Network, so we want to fill you in a little bit more on, on what it's all about. Um, there's three of us today because we all have different parts to play um, in this new um, campaign. So um, I'm going to start off first, but I have with me Linda McMillan is with the Port Hood Welcome Group and Councillor uh, Lynn Chisholm is here, obviously, and uh, she's on the uh, Cape Breton Local Immigration Committee. So, so um, the Newcomer Network is an initiative of the Cape Breton Partnership, funded by the Nova Scotia Office of Immigration. It was launched in 2020, so just this fall, basically. And it is designed to support Cape Breton communities to do what they do best, be welcoming. Norma G. McLeod was hired to coordinate the program and seek out champions and communities across Cape Breton Island. So that's, that's kind of where I, I came in. She uh, contacted me just to, for some help to find champions in our communities to who, who might be ready or willing to uh, take this on. So um, that's how Linda got involved, because I gave them. Um, I thought maybe the, the our development associations would be a good fit for this kind of program. So that's where we started. But it doesn't have to be a development association. So we're still looking for more um, groups to start up. Um, right now, as it stands, there are 50 volunteers across Cape Breton Island in uh, six distinct communities. Um, in, in Inverness <coughs> County, we have Shed Camp, Port Hood, and Judith. The volunteer welcomers are people who are, are well-connected and very familiar with their community, their history, the history of the community, their local activities, hidden gems, all of those kinds of things that um, we want our newcomers to learn about when they move here. So I'm going to pass it on to Lynn. We all have a, a script. <laughs> um, and then on to Linda after, after Lynn. So. I can just stay right here, so I'm not moving sure. too much. Okay, so the Cape Breton Partnership Initiative plays a uh, coordinating role, supporting the Welcome Group with tools and resources needed to thrive. They also work to uh, to make sure that every newcomer in uh, Cape Breton knows how to reach the nearest Welcome Group. Each Welcome Group will be unique across Cape Breton and work to the best uh, to best to meet the needs of newcomers in each particular community. Regular activities could include making baskets, welcome baskets, sorry, uh, hosting community events, and offering tours um, of uh, the community. The program is valuable to newcomers uh, 
and immigration is making a positive difference across our province, strengthening and revitalizing rural communities and benefiting our provincial um, economy. So all of this information obviously is in your package. Mm -hmm. I, I did list the groups that were um, that are set up currently and the contact, contact information. So uh, Linda has been gracious enough to come in and talk a little bit about her involvement with the Port Hood group and what they've been up to. Okay. Some of my thunder has been stolen, but I'll just add <laughs> live here. So our group, I found out about the group through Port Hood Development and that they were looking to develop one with Judy together. But then we just decided that Port Hood people knew Port Hood and Judy people knew everything about Judy, so we decided to separate and have our own. So we've only really had two meetings so far. There's seven of us involved, and uh, we, um, we set boundaries uh, between the two, well, for what area that we're going to deliver the welcoming uh, baskets to. So we decided that there were several different ways that we were going to get the public to know about it. So one was we had posters put up in the community with contact addresses and emails, and uh, a social media page would be set up. And we were going to put like newsletters with the churches and uh, contact the local schools. And if there's new children being registered, that they could pass our information along to the parents. And, um, and also in the local newspapers. So, and of course, the biggest way is by word of mouth. So right now we have five families that are waiting for their baskets and to be welcomed. And we hope to get that done next week. So when we, I knew I was talking weird. <laughs> <laughs> so when we do our baskets, we're putting in, it took us about a week or so, and we did up a list of all the services in the ported area from churches to recreation groups to where to get your car fixed, what the, the uh, our counselor's name is, or MLA, like just everything that we could think of that a, that a newcomer would you know, want to access. And then we're putting in other brochures, like the Cape Breton Partnership brochure about uh, the welcoming committees in, in Cape Breton. And Port Hood Development themselves, we have a, a really colorful little map about the community and the services and where everything is located. And then we were going to put a $20 gift certificate from one of the, um, one of the local um, stores in the community. And I also got the Oran and the reporter to give us six month free subscriptions for people. And, um, and of course, a goodie in the goodie basket too, right? So with that, we will approach people and not everybody wants as much welcoming as the next person, so we will sort of see what they want, uh, how they want us to show them around, if they want to <coughs> accompany us to community activities when COVID is gone. So just to make them feel welcome and knowledgeable, I guess, of the, of the area. So we reached out to uh, Port of Development, and uh, they gave us a little contribution just to get us going with the baskets and the first gift certificates. <coughs> so we will be actively looking for funding in, in the future. So um, that's about it. So looking forward to meeting some new people. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, there is some, some more information on how to, to be uh, Look up the, the website for the uh, Welcome Network. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, from do I just want to make a comment? Yes. Um, the, to welcome is it's people have maybe moved away and moved back. It's not always like immigration. It's no, it's, no. It's any yeah, anyone it's, that moves just anyone that moves into a community. It's not. Yeah. It's not inclusive. It's, right. it's anyone that moves. But it's great that you have five. Great. Yeah. Five already. Well, it's wonderful. Judic yeah. has had. Judic has had 18 since last March. Oh yeah. my gosh, just yeah. something. Yeah. And I think like all the most kind of there to go <laughs> There's an interest there too, yes. yeah. 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 Carol Counselor Gillis just said they all came back because she was counselor. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
um, expecting big things. <laughs> I have a quick question. Um, if another community <coughs> other than these want, like, I'm thinking of our larger area development or someone want to take on a project like Definitely. This, would they go through that with, like, how What's the best way to start or get involved? Um, they could call me. Okay. I, I just sort of um, become a liaison, I guess, for, right. for the Cape Breton, for Norma. Jean and the Cape Breton Partnership for now. She's only there on a term, so this this will change. And but I can certainly. Um, I think it's an help excellent them. initiative, and I thank you for your presentation. And I think that all councillors should look at like yeah. I'm going to go to our development association. Yes. And say this is something you should maybe take a look at. But I would. It would be really helpful to the community and new people coming here. We're trying to attract yeah. people to our communities. So uh, and that word. If I see a, a family moving here, and that word spreading from how they were welcomed into the community, spreading to other families in their exactly. circle, yeah. to say what a great place, and that, that, that's going to attract more people. Yeah. I did send out information to all development associations. Okay. Oh, I put some feelers out there, so there's some that weren't quite ready, but there is interest yeah. definitely in other communities, so it's not it's not exclusive to these three. It's anybody yeah, no, that I don't, wants I to be part of it. it. I think it's. I think it'd be nice to see it in yeah. all the major communities yeah. and I think, municipality. Be great. Yeah. I think there are some community groups, like say in Scottsville, where they did some of the women take it. You know, or families take it upon themselves to put some things together for people that have residents. Exactly. Yeah, so and that's, that's and exactly that. what they've done. Nice. That's how they how it started in Judic, actually. Right. Yeah. yeah. So they do with it. You know, on their own, without any funding or whatever. Yeah. Kudos to them. Yeah. But I, I think there made there's a role for the municipality to play. Yes, there is. Place. Absolutely. 100%. Any other councillors have any other questions or comments or? Thank you very much, ladies. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Mm -hmm. You didn't even ask us for money, so that's not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody alluded to it. You're warm, you know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> 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 Our Christine has circulated uh, a memo to the council here that we didn't have when we brought up this, this, this item before, which was item number um, 9G. So we're coming back to that and we'll deal with that now while we have a minute. Um, I'll ask Christine to give us an overview of her memo here. Yes, thank you, Lord. Um, so at the last committee of the hall meeting on February 18th, uh, the public appointment mid policy was put before council as a first notice of motion. Uh, based on comments uh, from council, um, there was only one revision asked to be made by staff, and that was to change section 6.4. Um, section 6.4 in the, the first version said that no member of the public shall serve on more than one committee or external board or agency at any given time. Uh, council wished for that to be amended because uh, there are certainly some volunteers who can operate on more than one board at one time. And so um, attached to this memo is an amended uh, policy based on uh, feedback from council. And so section 6.4 in, in the amended policy was amended to read, a member of the public may serve on more than one committee or external board or agency at any given time. Uh, other than that revision, no other changes have been made to the public appointment policy in your package there. Okay. So, we need a motion to approve this amendment. I will move to approve that council adopt the public appointment policy as presented in the council package for this meeting. Seconder? Seconder. Seconded by Councillor Gillis. Any further discussion or questions? I think we've gone through that process at our COW meeting. Um, question, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carried. Perfect. Thank you. Is that out of the way? So, we don't have our next presenter yet, do we, CAO? No, we're just 
Yeah. Still ahead of schedule. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's but the way I like it. As they come, as they arrive, we can have them set up. Mm -hmm. First come, first serve. Yeah. Okay. I have need a washroom break for a second, so it's a good time to do it. And if someone comes in, Deputy Warden, you can. Council can. Uh, we're all going to get, take another quick recess. We'll go down to see if there's if they've arrived. And uh, we need a motion to re recess again, then. I'll make a motion to recess. Ten minutes. Still, yeah, for another ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Someone want to second that? That's there. Second by Councilor McClellan. All in favor, aye. Aye. <laughs> Uh, Councilor John McClendon, District 4, Wicogama, Wake Above, Lake Ainsley, Airy River Dennis, Delta Valley Watch, and Aberdeen. <laughs> Councilor Lynn Chisholm, and Port Hood, Mabu, and all those areas. Councilor Gillis, uh, District 6. You guys are like Doctors Without Borders, or like Council Without Borders? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Maureen Brent. I'm the warden and also counselor for District 2, which is the Marguerite, Lemoyne, Grand Tang, up to Lake Ainsley, that area of Lake Law. I'm Bonnie McIsaac. I'm a deputy warden and uh, counselor for District 3, which is Dunvegan, Inverness, Glenville, and Scottsville, down towards Stratford. The District 1, Alfred Poirier from uh, Seneca. Mead Cove, Pleasant Bay, and of course, and again, you know, Councilor. Okay, you guys want to like, introduce yourselves as well? Okay. Okay. Well, I'm Trevor. Well, I'm Trevor Boudreaux. I'm a former councillor for the town of Port Hawkesbury. We didn't have districts, so I could just say town of Port Hawkesbury, but I am um, one of the co-chairs for our committee in Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health. This has been in operation for just a little over a year. And, so. and I'm Megan McDonald, one of the healthcare recruiting navigators for the group. Hey, the floor is yours. You're working with Trevor. Welcome. You're working with Trevor. Yes. I know. <laughs> Welcome, so, folks. And you thank you. Carry on. Just try to keep it to around 50 minutes if you could. Okay. So the Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health group. So as Trevor said, this group came about, was formed about a year ago. And with our mandate to the Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health as a community-led organization, that serves the Cape Breton South area. So that covers the town of Port Hawkesbury and Richmond County. We're focused on the recruitment and retention of healthcare professionals and better access to healthcare services for our community members. So we have community representatives from some of the following groups. Uh, so the town of Port Hawkesbury, the municipality of Richmond County, the Street Richmond Hospital, the Dr. Kingston Health Center, St. Anne's Community and Nursing Care Center, Straight Area Chamber of Commerce, Cape Breton Partnership, Continuing Care Nova Scotia, the Island Gateway Medical Clinic, the Air Shack Clinic. Are Richmond you able to pick your voice up just a little, yeah. little bit? Yep, Richmond Villa, and Physicians and Health Professionals in the area. So a lot of my work is I work alongside Nova Scotia Health um, recruiters. So Victoria McCauley is the recruitment consultant in our Eastern Zone. So she's provided a quote. Um, and she says, a community navigator is an important asset to Nova Scotia Health, physician, recruitment, and consultant. The navigator can act as a local expert and help to connect physicians and their families to the resources and networks um, within a community. So some of the things we have done so far, um, so we've built our website and social media development. Um, we do a lot of networking, so building relationships in our local communities, um, making connections with other community groups and uh, as a way to promote our region together. And we connect with local healthcare professionals and contacts made through, through the group. And we also do a lot of presentations. So we present at healthcare recruitment job fairs provincially and abroad. It's all been virtually this year. Um, and we provide information sessions to local healthcare programs such as the CCA students or LPN classes in our So why is this important? Access to health care in rural communities. With an aging population in the Cape Breton South region, it's critical that residents have access to the health care services they require. Access to high quality health care services is important for maintaining overall health 
preventing and managing disease, and achieving overall mental and physical wellness. So a community that offers an abundance of healthcare services um, attracts more families and businesses, improving their overall economic growth. Um, so, so far we've participated in organized events. Uh, we've participated at Dow Family Medicine online conferences, built and maintained professional working relationships with the Nova Scotia Health, um, the Straight Richmond Fan Hospital Foundation Board, and many others. We've also had the opportunity to host uh, local <coughs> physicians in our area, and we have welcomed new healthcare practitioners as well. So what's next is we hope to continue our work with the community and healthcare facilities to better understand the barriers we face and how we can overcome them as communities. We hope to participate in future healthcare career fairs and conferences online and in person, continuously develop and maintain our online presence, and create and present various information sessions to healthcare programs. So we do have a strong social media presence, so you can follow us on any of these platforms with our hashtag there, and you can also visit us uh, on our website. So Maggie does the formal presentation, and then I get into talking a little bit about how we got together, why we got together, and, and what our goals and our mandate is. And really, you know, last January, uh, well, I'll take it back a bit, a bit further than that. When I was on town council, uh, in my third year, so two years ago, uh, council made an initiative saying we're short physicians. So we were, we were struggling with physician recruitment and we made that a priority. So they have all and told me and my wife to go to a conference in Halifax that had to do with attracting physicians to rural Nova Scotia, or rural Canada. So there were 40 booths from across Canada trying to recruit physicians and that's where you realize there's lots that we didn't know about recruiting physicians to our area. And uh, so we continued to make that a priority. And then we got talking to some of our colleagues in Richmond County, and um, they were struggling, the Kingston Clinic, especially in Lordway. So right now they have a, a clinic there that should have two family physicians, a nurse practitioner, and a um, family, uh, family practice nurse. Right now they're down to one physician. And that physician was supposed to leave which means they would have had, at this point, they have a nurse practitioner who's there but is hurt um, and is off right now, so they would have no practitioners in that clinic. And so the manager from that clinic asked us to, if we'd host a meeting in, in, at the Straight Richmond. So we had, you saw the list of the different organizations that were invited. Um, and so we all got together and we, we kind of brainstormed what are our issues. And we, originally it was about physician recruitment, but it became more than that. We recognized the importance of all of our healthcare providers. And, and part of that actually came out in a presentation to the Strait Area Chamber of Commerce. They had the State of the Strait, and some of you may have been there, I'm not sure. But um, what they found in businesses is that businesses have said now one of the most critical things to attracting uh, people and um, people to their businesses is access to healthcare. So if, if you try to bring in an engineer or somebody to your community and they can't get a doctor, well, it's really difficult to keep them there. Um, the northern part, Shetty Camp, and I think Inverness does very good with their physicians, but generally speaking, anywhere else in Cape Breton really struggles. And um, so you try to look at what health works around the rest of the province and you try to emulate that. But our role isn't to to recruit them. We don't have any recruitment ability. We don't have the mandate. We don't have the money. We don't have all of that. What we are is a tool for recruitment purposes. So when we have a recruiter saying we have locums that are coming to the area or we have uh, residents that are coming to the area, well, we try to put on a show. So we try to take them around, show them around, make sure they understand what our culture is, what we're about. And so last year we had six international doctors um, come to Port Hawkesbury, um, and I toured them around Port Hawkesbury in the area. Um, we're happy to announce one's in quarantine right now in Port Hawkesbury, and we'll be starting in two weeks. So we will have our first, we've attracted our first physician to the area, um, which is very exciting. Um, but there's a lot more work to be done. So right now, I don't know if people have heard in the news, but one of the physicians who was in the air shack clinic has moved over to be a hospitalist at the Straight Richmond Hospital, which is great for the hospital. What we do need are people who take care of our inpatients. We absolutely do. And this is going to give some consistency there, but that has now meant that a thousand more people are without a doctor. 
So we're thousands of people without a doctor. And, and one of the reasons we're here tonight is because doctors, do, you know, people don't have borders with their doctors, right? There are people from Port Hood who see doctors in Port Hawkesbury, and there are people from Port Hawkesbury who see doctors in Inverness. We're all in this together, and so the burden goes on the other physicians and the other practitioners in the area. You know, I'm, not a, I'm a chiropractor by trade, I'm not a doctor, but I can tell you in the last nine months, my practice has gone through the roof, right? To get into my office, you used to be able to see me in a week. Now it's four to five weeks to get in, which is, it's showing you the burden that's happening everywhere. We're starting to fill in these gaps and we're starting to get overworked. So there's a, there's a role to be played by making sure we have the right complement and the right people. And um, that's what we're trying to do with this group. And we're a very open group. So we meet usually every second Thursday. We invite different groups to come in and speak to us. We had um, Aaron came and he spoke on behalf of um, community health boards yesterday. So he talked to us about their role in supporting health in our communities. We had a meeting the week before, or two weeks before, with Madonna McDonald, um, who is the VP of Operations for the region, to talk about strategies to attracting, retaining, and recruiting healthcare providers. Um, it's no easy task, right? Like, we don't have um, a big pile of money to be doing this. So we've been very fortunate that our municipalities of Richmond and, and Port Hawkesbury both stepped up, put some money in, and what it allowed us to do was actually hire someone. So Maggie, we were able to hire, along with some help from the federal government through their grants program, to hire Maggie to have somebody working on this full time. So it's not easy for a bunch of us to work on it part time on the side of our desk. Some of us are, a lot of our group right now are our counselors in the other two districts, or they have full time jobs as well doing something else. So our goal is to make sure people are aware of what we're doing. If you have healthcare providers moving to your community or you know somebody is or they need help with something, that's what we're there to do. So if it's about finding housing, if it's about finding daycares, if it's about supporting spouses to try and find work, we're, we're trying to be able to be supportive of our healthcare providers. And so that's kind of the, the role that Maggie takes on. She's like our firefighter. She's putting out fires all the time. And um, our role is to kind of support her in that. So, I, I, you know, the overview that Maggie gave was kind of the, the basis of what we do, but the reality is, is we're, trying to, we're trying to make sure we keep our complement, or at least we're trying to grow it, but at least keep what we have as well. So attracting, retaining, and um, supporting our health care providers. So any questions? <coughs> what kind of budget do you have for every year? Good question. So, so like we sat down as a group and said, in an ideal world, what would what would it cost to really do what we need to do? And that's about welcoming, uh, whether it's about welcoming residents in or doing locums or going out and doing, um, you know, uh, promotion of it at, at different organizations or events, hiring Maggie. We, we looked at about $90,000 to do that for the year. Last year, both Richmond and Port Hawkesbury stepped up with $25,000 each. And we were also able to get a 16 week grant from the federal government. And um, the hospital foundation uh, generously gave us $5,000, the Straight Richmond. And so we've been working with that budget for this year. But there's been no long-term commitment. I think if you've been following the news a little bit in Antigonish, they decided to, to, decided to get a navigator system as well. And they committed. So the hospital foundation and both Antigonish Town and Council, or County, both committed to a three-year $30,000 each. So they figured the same numbers out we did and came to a $90,000 budget and said, we're each going to put in a third, a third, a third for three years to commit to this to see if we can support our, our health care providers. We don't have that yet. Um, we'd love to have that. But uh, Just an another question. Do you see a role in Inverness County for your I, well, I think you, you heard me say it a little bit there. We're all in it together. That's right. And so it's, it's really neat. We had Dr. Chaison speak to us uh, two weeks ago as well um, because he's the physician kind of chair for the area. So he supports physician recruitment for the whole of our area. And he would say we have more of a struggle down this way, but it's, it's basically from <coughs> Mabu down like that, that the struggle is. So there is, there is a, a role for you guys to play. I don't know what role you're looking for or what you'd be interested in doing, but certainly even somebody coming to some of our meetings to see what it is we're about. They're all virtual. They're, they're two hours long. I drive people crazy sometimes. But um, 
But, uh, but there, there is, I think there is a role. We're all in this together. The reality is, you know, Mulgrave has with, been without any, am I running out of time? Oh no. Mulgrave has been w without a nurse practitioner for five years. That's who I used to see. I finally got a call this week. I have a nurse practitioner in Port Hawkesbury that just started. That's who I'm, my family and I are going to be able to see. So we haven't had someone, but the, you know, we're all in this together. And um, guys grow struggles with stuff as well. We have a locum doctor who has been really gracious to help our ERs. He's helping guys grow, Annie Ganesh, and the straight. But, but yeah, no, there's a role. We don't have an ask at this point. We were, it was more for information purposes, right? Like, I think it's important for everybody to know what we're doing, and, but there hasn't been an official ask. It's just, we wanted to inform. Well, just on a, a comment, just as a few days ago, I had a call from a close friend of mine in Vancouver who's a quadriplegic who wants to retire back in other but he's done pretty well for himself. Um, he's pretty self-sufficient financially, but the first question he asked is, if I come back to Nova Scotia, what's well, there for health care? Yeah. And uh, he knows what's in Halifax because that's where he lived, but he'd like to go beyond Halifax somewhere, and uh, so I'm, I'm trying to find some resources for him in different places. I know Victoria County struggled as well, like they... They, they, were, they were doing through the same thing as we are. So you have a little pocket that you're doing well in, but the rest of Cape Breton is, is having some struggles. I'll tell you an interesting part of Council Corey's comment there, but in Inverness Hospital, I know my doctor is Dr. Bennett, and I know he's been very instrumental in working with other doctors coming in there, especially residents uh, in terms of the program. He's he, through that program, he, so he'd be a, he's very interesting, might be another Oh yeah, well we're, we're tapping into some of that. So Dow Medicine, the residency program, they started a satellite in Sydney and then they've moved some to Inverness, which is wonderful. We're getting people into our communities to see what it's like to live here. And that's what's going to attract people, right? So what we're saying is, is wouldn't it be great if we could have some more residents kind of put in other communities to kind of get that experience? So I think you're right on, like there's, there's an opportunity to get learners in our communities. Because if you get them when they're young, and I, I joke about this, but it's true. If you get them there when they're not attached to someone and you find them someone in the community, they're stuck there, right? But, <laughs> but, uh, but that's a half joking and half true, right? So, oh, yeah, that's right. But, but part of it is, is just getting, getting them involved in the community, right? Like I've been texting the new doctor who's in quarantine and my wife's making him cupcakes and he likes spicy food, so I'm going to find the spiciest food I can make him. You and, go. you know, and you're trying to, you're trying to find ways of counsel, supporting them. Counsel for you? Yeah, uh, uh, it's amazing to see, you know, like uh, we're very lucky in Shetika, you know, because we uh, basically the school is the farm club of the team. You know, like Dr. O'Connor retired four or five years ago. My niece came down, I'm really 30 years old. Now there's another doctor planning to retire. There's another girl ready to come in to replace them. There's two other doctors that are, were from Shetikam, but I don't think they'll be coming around because there's no room. And there's another one, uh, Devo, she's from maybe a year or two before she graduates, uh, Devo, you know. Okay. And, uh, so we were. So that'll take them up that way. Yeah, no, no. We've got a French like, community down in El Madam like, that'll, uh, that'll look fun. I mean, these, these it, it, if you can tap into these, uh, I don't know why, we're lucky in the last three or four or five years, we end up with five doctors. You we know, have, we have students from the area that are in med school right now and but that are they, looking to go to med school. So part of what we need to be doing is kind of supporting them in their studies and right. figuring out ways of helping them. but. The challenge for rural, and Inverness has a little bit of a, a better system, like we can attract family physicians. We don't have positions for specialists. And so when they get to med school, they start figuring out where they want to go. And a lot of them take the specialist route, right? That's where quality of life often tends to be. If you're a family practice doctor, you know, you go to the grocery store, your people are wanting to show you their feet. They're wanting to, you know, like they're, they're following you through the vegetable aisle, right? So it's a... Uh, it's one, of these, it's one of these things where there's challenges, but there's benefits to working in a rural community, right? And so I think it's about us showing those and, and making sure they experience that. And even in rural areas, you know, there are a few doctors that I know that they left and they wouldn't come back, you know, they wouldn't come to Shetigan to, to they come. They come to visit. Yeah, they come to visit, you know, but these two were lucky that they, they, they wanted to come back. They wanted to they went yes. to school, 
Mitch you have anything to come back. That's way. it. Stop. 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 Our CAO Keith McDonald would like to ask a question. I was just wondering the contact you have with uh, the recruiter from Homes Christian Health Story, where, where are they located? So there's actually two recruiters for, our, for the Eastern Zone. Uh, Bill O'Brien is out of Sydney and generally works mostly in the CBRM area. Victoria McCauley is out of Antigonish. And so she works pretty much out of there, but she does come up once in a while. Like, she, so yeah. she covers the whole Eastern Zone between the two of them. It's been a real shift in how the province does recruiting. So it used to be nine health zones and they all had their own individual recruiter. And then when they created that one health uh, authority that kind of got pushed to the side a little bit and they kind of dipped with their recruitments and then we've seen the realization is we're all hurting so now they've created a system where they're starting to get two per zone they have one that just deals with med schools but their you know their role is to identify when there's a need and then try to fill that need the problem is is you know if you have a Dr. Collins who wants to retire in a couple of years or you have a Dr. Marshawn who wants to retire in a couple of years if you're not starting to plan ahead when they retire, if you don't have somebody ready to go, you've, you've got more people. So, pre amalgamation of the health authorities, there was Dr. Nackley would have been the lead or playing a role out of this, uh, this area. Um, Dr. Hilliard was as well. Dr. Hilliard yes. was out of any But then they had a full support system, and that, as you just stated, that all went away significant void and now it's seeing that areas of the problems are playing catch up because of that, that policy shift. Yep. Not only that, there's now a significant weighted uh, effort on communities that was set up to play a role in what is a provincial. You know, eight uh, years ago as a councillor, we would have been saying this is not a, a mandate of the municipal government. Exactly. Right? Healthcare is not a municipality responsibility. What I will tell you is we don't have a choice. But that's due to avoid... Oh, absolutely. But, but if we don't take some initiative as a, as a community or as a, like, yes. we're in trouble. I, I, but I don't disagree. I know where you're going with it and I'd love to take it to another level. But, uh, but councils can't take it to another some advocate advocacy yeah. and that's part of we didn't get into that role but that's something we're trying to do here is an advocacy role as well saying pushing pushing you know think outside the box too right so we've been stuck in boxes all along this is how things have always been and it's really tough sometimes to get out of them and we're we're working on it perhaps if the town and richmond and Wernes county all can come together and do some kind of advocacy to, on behalf of that with the provincial government 100 percent uh, we'd be in support of that. We'd be happy with that. Okay. Well, listen, we're, we've gone way over 15 minutes. But Thank you. Very much. She <laughs> didn't. I did. She, like, <laughs> that's why they let me there. That's, they don't like me coming to these things. But I did it in Richmond, too. Uh, your information is very valuable. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm 0 for 2 on time. And, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was very nice to talk. You'd like to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. My name is Jim Cavanaugh. I'm the fire chief in uh, Port Hastings. I thought I heard a knock behind me there for a second. I was saying I'm the fire chief in Port Hastings. I've been a firefighter for about 34 years. I started when I was six. And uh, <laughs> everyone laughs at that for some reason. <laughs> um, I'm new president of Mutual Aid. I've been, I was recording secretary for, I think, 18 years with them. Uh, with me this evening is well, on the stripe over there is Paul Shears, the, uh, deputy, or the Vice President of Mutual Aid, Firefighter of West Bay Road Fire Department. He's been a firefighter for 13 years, thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah. Right straight across from me, Caroline McGinnis, retired Deputy Chief for West Bay Road Fire Department. She's our Recording Secretary for Mutual Aid, 29 Nine. years of service. And last but not least, Bobby McAcker, our Treasurer for the Mutual Aid Association, member of West Bay Road. Uh, 45, 45, 45 years. So, a few years under the belt. Uh, I guess before we start, we definitely want to say thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come down and speak to you and give you an idea of who we are and what we do and, and, and you know, it's a little bit of background on the fire service. So I guess to start it off, we were formed in 1976 by nine area fire departments. Our mission, continuous improvements of the fire and emergency services in the straight area. 
Current membership is 28 fire departments from parts of Richmond, Inverness, Guysboro, and Anaganish counties, along with the towns of Port Hawkesbury, Anaganish, and Mulgrave. A highly dedicated team of volunteers operating emergency services while providing, crit providing critical help as needed. An asset to local residents, business, industry, schools, municipalities, and the provincial government and guests to the region. Some affiliates that we associate with quite often. Fire Service Association of Nova Scotia, Maritime Fire Chiefs Association, Nova Scotia Firefighter School, Emergency Health Services, the Office of, Office of the Fire Marshal, and the Training for Association organized by our training chairperson. How does Greater Mutual Aid assist in Vernes County? Uh, we originally purchased paging equipment back in 1983. Paging equipment is how every fire department gets alerted of an emergency where, when it is. Uh, this equipment was begged, borrowed, acquired any which way it possibly could. Uh, at the time, it was probably some of the best equipment in the area. Now, it's starting to show its age. Uh, so, uh, like I say, that's how we notify our members. Uh, we acquired and maintained an equipment for filling air bottles. Uh, air bottles is what we use during fire, uh, any fires to keep our members safe. Uh, then bottles have to be filled, of course. And now, instead of sending them out, keeping them out of service, we do it locally and that's located in the Port Hawkesbury Fire Station. That's another piece of equipment that was bought by mutual aid. Uh, our mutual aid agreement enables neighboring departments to respond to other coverage areas when requested, allowing cost savings to municipalities and departments. So if Port Hood needs help with a fire, uh, you know, Judah can come, uh, Port Hastings can come, Inverness can come, you know, Inverness is outside of our area. We go down as far as Mabu, uh, but our association does go outside its own coverage areas quite often. All right. Dispatch capabilities with local 911 via our, our little dispatch center in Port Hawkesbury, cancer dispatch owned and operated by Bill McDonald. Uh, the initiated a provincially recognized ground search and rescue unit, which responds to searches both within our coverage area as well as other areas as requested. It, it was originally primarily made up of firefighters. Uh, since that, they've grown and became an entity of their own. Now search and rescue is of their own, but most of their members now are still members of volunteer fire departments. They did uh, purchase, they have their own training center now, which is located in Trackade. Partial list of equipment that's available, you know, anywhere that it needs to go. Extrication tools, commonly known as the jaws of life. Uh, 12 sets within our association, four in Richmond County, one in the town of Port Hawkesbury, two in Inverness County, one in the town of Anaganish, one in Geisler County, and three in Anaganish County. Again, these are only within the departments, within our association. You know, if there's one in Inverness, or there's one in, in you know, outside, that we're only including what our area covers. Um, these uh, tools regularly respond to motor vehicle collisions outside their regular fire coverage, and provide uh, area departments that do not have that kind of equipment. I'll use my department as an example. I don't have extrication equipment. Port Hawkesbury is three minutes away from me. So if I get called to a motor vehicle collision, I'm rolling them at the same time. That way, because a normal set of jaws is about $70,000 to buy. Instead of me owning it and having one three minutes away, our mutual aid allows us to roll together, you know, and make it more efficient and save uh, taxpayers money. Uh, ladder trucks, one in the town of Port Hawkesbury, one in the town of Anaganish, both these have responded uh, to emergencies both inside and outside their area. We've had the ladder truck from Anaganish down in Port Hawkesbury in, in Point Tupper. So, and that's how our mutual aid works. Additional equipment, several ATV snowmobile rescue sleds, ice and water rescue equipment, high and low angle rescue gear, confined space rescue gear, gas testing equipment, infrared heat cameras. Now this is only a partial list of equipment operated by volunteer personnel, which are essential to respond to Inverness County emergencies. These are the tools used to protect their families, properties, local businesses, and workplaces. They say not every fire department has every bit of these tools. Uh, I often compare it to, for anyone who watches Chicago Fire, where people are sitting in the fire station and they're responding in three minutes with 15 people and $10 million worth of equipment is a fantasy. We're a volunteer fire service. We're sitting at home waiting for the call to come in and we use the equipment that we have. What Inverness County could do to assist emergency preparedness and cooperation with the Straight Area Mutual Aid Association? Ask number one. Meet regularly with our association to discuss concerns. For instance, we now have Seaside Communication on board since January of this year to provide some of their internet towers to enhance our paging capabilities for fire departments within our mutual aid association. We have also received a ballpark figure of roughly $70,000 for a new paging system to replace our aging system. 
We are currently undertaking measures to approach all level of governments to obtain necessary funding. No service, no response. We don't have to tell you about cell service. Some areas it's good, some areas it's bad. Paging is no different. Some areas it's good, some areas it's bad. So we're looking to enhance the system that we have to have, make sure that all fire departments have coverage no matter where they're at. <clears throat> That's number two. Provide us some information on how the municipality could fund, engineer, design, supply labor, and equipment to ensure dry hydrants are in place for areas of Inverness County that do not have municipal water hydrant systems available. This is of the utmost urgency. Also to ensure municipal systems are tested, repaired, maintained, and cleared of snow in the winter to make firefighters' job much safer and more efficient. Safety of firefighters <coughs> is of the utmost importance when drafting from water sources. And if you not sure what I mean by dry hydrants. Probably the next video is going to show what a dry hydrant is, and I'll get into it when we see that. Ask number three. Consider how it would be possible for Inverness County to assist with purchase of needed equipment, which could be shared amongst departments, such as host testing equipment, which would save individual departments money and ultimately preserve lives. Providing money for essential emergency preparedness equipment maintains Maintenance allows volunteers to have safe and reliable equipment needed. Uh, that's just one that thing that we brought up at our last two meetings that we had. Is uh, it was the hose testing equipment that we're looking at because every fire department has to make sure that the hose is safe to, to be able to be used. Uh, we had one fire department within our association actually get a company in to do it, and it was around eight hundred dollars per truck. Most tr most departments have two or three trucks, so it can get very costly, and it's something that has to be done every year. All right. Ask number four. Consider having a municipality may be able to free up funding for volunteer fire service within the county. Possibly looking at the passing on of the provincial grant money given to the municipality in lieu of the fire levy to the departments that have provincial or federal uh, buildings within their districts instead of it going into the general account. Another possibility would have these funds go into a fire service capital account to fund fire service equipment. Uh, funding for the fire service is not being kept up with the cost or standards that we now uh, met by the fire service. We bought our last pumper in 1997 that cost us two hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars that truck right now is five hundred thousand dollars to buy the exact same truck and most insurance underwriters want you to change them every 15 years typical incidents of some of the uh, things that we do motor vehicle collisions that's some of the towers that some of our paging equipment is on uh, the console you see down in, in the bottom right hand of the screen, that's not our dispatch center. That is a bigger dispatch center. We have a small one that uh, does us really well. He treats us really well. We have great support from him. Here's a typical picture of what a dry hydrant is. So a dry hydrant for us, for, do for those of us who don't have, or in areas that don't have municipal water, is a place where we can suck water from a standard water source safely. So we can pull up to a lake, a pond, a river, wherever. Uh, hook our trucks to this pipe that's sticking under the ground as you see in the far right picture here and we can suck water from that water source into our trucks so especially this time of year why they're so important is everything's frozen so where you could regularly suck water maybe in june or july january february and march you don't have that option and the safety of firefighters is utmost importance you can't have people out on thin ice now cutting holes to try to break through to get a hose in it we want to keep our firefighters safe also, we want to keep our area's residents safe as well. If uh, you have to travel 40 minutes to get a load of water to come back in a house fire, I don't have to tell you the devastation that that can cause. So we want to make sure that there's adequate water supply everywhere. It doesn't always have to be municipal hydrants, but dry hydrants can be put in. Now, the difference is 20 years ago, when you put a dry hydrant in, you got a friend with a backhoe, you got your pipes together, and you went out on a Sunday afternoon and you put them in. Times have changed. Now it's permits, now it's you know, approvals, they're all engineered, you know, designed and engineered. Uh, DFO, Department of Environment, before you even can put a shovel in the ground. The average cost, on an average, and every one is different, is approximately $10,000 for every one you put in. Right. We need to continue to work together. Over the past several decades, fire departments have, have evolved and become an emergency service, responding to a lot more than just fires. Our volunteers, and here's where I stress the word, volunteers, may not always be available to respond to emergencies due to family, work, or other commitments. 
This is the big reason why we feel that our association is critically important to ensure adequate help is available during an emergency. In summary, our association strongly believes that because of mutual aid, emergency service in our area has become a huge asset for people living in, working in, and traveling through our coverage areas. That is our quick presentation. If you have any questions, we'll try to answer them. I have a, I'll go with Councilor for you next, but I have a quick question. Sure. On, um, you talked about your uh, communications and system and using your towers that you have. Mm -hmm. Where does a TMR tower come into that? Do you, do you use them too? No, not, not for paging. We use them for our radio systems. Oh, that's radio. Yes, radio. That, that's totally different than paging. And with, with CSI coming on board, we were probably looking at what, and, and Paul chaired the committee we had on, on the uh, communication. It's got to be a couple of years. We've been going after people for adequate towers for us to use. So right now, Seaside is looking at uh, six new locations to put repeaters uh, in place to enhance the coverage area. So that will actually up our cost because we'll have more repeaters available to send the signal out for Yeah, so we're not only looking at replacing the 60-year-old equipment we have now, and some of that equipment was used when we got it. Uh, we're also looking at putting like, new stuff in to enhance our coverage area. So. Thank you. Yeah, a uh, few questions. First of all, I was fireman, uh, president of the Camp Fire Department for 18 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I just had a question. You see in Redis County, as far as I get this, it's Inverness Salt. It's not, yeah. in, it's not Inverness County. No, there is, an, there is an Inverness County Association as well. That's right. But our association only comes down as far as Madeline. Exactly, because there, I see Inverness County, but it's... Yeah, it's, and that, it's Inverness Soap. And that's why we said in the first presentation yeah. it was parts of Richmond County, that's right. parts of Antigonish, parts yeah. of, uh, you know, that's so right. we completely engulf uh, the town of Port Hawkesbury, the town of Antigonish, and the town of Mulgrave yeah. because of, you know, the geographical area is smaller. But, how are fire departments funded? I know those in Inverness County are uh, uh, 10 percent, uh, 10 cents per hundred per assessment, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, what about most of your fire departments? How are they funded? Because I tell you what, I'm asking, like if you have the population like Shadikap, you know, they have equipment, you know, like uh, uh, most of you do have, but at the same time, they have a, a tax base that they can rely on and they can live on. So that's where my question is, is all fire departments paying equally or how is it funded, you know? That's, that's my question, you know? My question is, why should Inverness County put some more money if put on three or, you know, for all around there, and then at the same time, uh, maybe they're not paying the, the, the same rate and, uh, than uh, all around the south and even the north, you know, so you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. All of the fire departments, well, I should say, I shouldn't say all, the majority of the fire departments within our association is paid by a, a, a tax levy. Right across. Right across, the, and, and it's different, uh, Richmond County has all three or four different rates. Yep. Yeah. So Depending on where, on, you know, where right. they're at. That's you know, right. some is 10, some is 12, some is eight, you know, and that can be based, it can make your capital um, <coughs> extremely different because yeah. I can tell you I, because we've done quite a bit of work in Richmond County so far you have fire departments that are making very well you know just shy of two hundred thousand dollars a year and you have fire departments that's making twenty five thousand dollars a year yeah. but the killer is is the fire department that's making twenty five thousand dollars a year still has to spend the exact same amount of money as the ones that's making two hundred because all your gear has to be certified every year uh, you can buy a set of turnout gear that costs about $3,000 and in 10 years you throw it out because I can't put you inside a structure fire anymore unless it's less than 10 years old. Insurance underwriters are telling us now my $500,000 truck is good for 15 years and then they expect you or want you to have new equipment to make sure everything is good. Um, every year my air bottles have to be inspected uh, every five years they got to be hydrostatically yeah. tested, my fire extinguishers. So to get to your, to your question, um, I guess in two things. One, like I say, every area is different. Yep. 
Uh, so I know in my area I get my levy and the grant money from the county. Yeah. And that's all we go on. And then we fundraise. Yeah. We have our, our bingo that we fundraise. Right. I can tell you that we, and I'm only talking about my own department, has put a piece on our hall and bought a new truck last year and our fundraising done that. Yeah. Because on an average, it costs me on a year that nothing really goes bad, mm -hmm. it's fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year to keep my doors open. Yeah. Uh, that's gone up to one hundred and twenty thousand. If you had like three years ago, we had two two of our roofs leaked. One was replaced and one was was fixed. If you have a major breakdown in a truck, twenty thousand dollars goes nowhere. Yeah. And as far as from one area to the other, and that's what our mutual aid association is, is very much pushing, is that. We may need the help of that fire department that has $28,000 a year and their equipment is 50 years old. They may be coming to back us up to protect your property, right? So that's why we don't look at individual fire departments. Everyone has their own equipment, but we look at everyone has to be safe in order to be able to do it. Yeah, I understand what you're saying because mm -hmm. I'm here in Shenikam and then I have Desenby, which get maybe 25000 I don't know. Yeah. And then you have St. Joseph the Wen gets about the same thing, you know, like mm -hmm. I think it's a review that maybe we should have a look overall, not only in Redis County, but as a whole, you know, to see Absolutely. how, you know, how the fire service, we can uh, all group together to see, uh, you know, because uh, as we move along and the smaller, it seems anyway, the smaller communities are getting smaller, it's, you know, and... Uh, and the tax base isn't there. Like it, some yeah. of the bigger ones, like I say, in Richmond County has, it's not a very big geographical area they have, but there's a lot of tax base there, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of commercial right. property. Uh, you know, they can strive on it, they can do well. If you have an area, like you say, like Pleasant Bay, yeah. where you're only getting 25000 $27,000 a year, and I can tell you, just my insurance alone, before I even open the door, is $15,000 a year. So if I'm only making 25 and I'm spending 15 on insurance, you know, uh, it's $3,000 for a set of bunker gear, it's $9,000 for a breathing uh, yeah, apparatus, I know, I know it's $800 for a length of hose. Everything's expensive. If you put an NFPA stamp on anything, yeah. the I price understand. skyrockets. I understand. Thank you for your question. Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah. have a quick question about your fundraising. Has it gone down with COVID? <laughs> uh, how much has it gone down? We're okay, it. no, it hasn't gone down. It's plummeted. Yeah. Because we went from doing very well to zero. Right. I'm sure. Luckily, I'm sure. Uh, and, and I gotta tip my hat to the Amherst Fire Fire Department who started, and I'm, I'm sure oh, most years yes. are aware oh, of the 50/50 right. yeah. yeah. draw. Yeah. But that's something they took on on their own. And luckily, that they opened it up that fire departments right. across the province could get into it. So thank heavens for them. Uh, but. At, le at least an 80% drop. Okay. And for a while, at, for the first six months, it was 100% drop. Because okay. we okay. went from right, right to zero. I mentioned bingo. I didn't know if you were doing it online or like on TV or whatever. No. So I was just kind of curious because yeah. I knew in person wasn't working for yeah. it. No. Uh, one in our local area started up again. Uh, ours won't start until the COVID restrictions are right. done. Okay. But yeah, it's, it's. Explain to me. So. You serve part of Inverness County as well. Obviously, you're located in Inverness County. Mm -hmm. You're in Port Hastings. Right. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of dollars is Inverness County providing to the tax base right now for your department? I'd have to look back on the records to, to give you an exact amount. you are amount. getting the, the normal tax yes. cut that you would for the area of service. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's our tax levy we get, plus, plus the county grant that we get that every you fire get, department. you get tax levy for Hawkesbury too? No. Nope. No. No. It's just what you get from Inverness. Just from Inverness. Oh, okay. yeah. Port Hawkesbury gets Port Hawkesbury. Well, Port Hawkesbury is different. They don't run quite the same because they're a town department. Yeah. So they don't get uh, the per se tax levy. They're, they have a budget every year that they run on. And everything is paid. Like when the oil tank, the oil truck comes to our hall, we get the $1,000 bill. When the oil truck goes to theirs, it's submitted to the town. Yeah. So that makes it the, the difference there. Okay. If, if I could, I just, I'll give you an example of Richmond County. So the lowest area rate in Richmond County for a fire department is nine cents on the hundred. The highest is at 17 cents on the hundred. So as you can see, the department with the lowest number has the biggest population base and a lot of, uh, commercial. Right? Yeah. The smaller departments that are out in the middle of nowhere, they're at the 17 cents. But as Jim already turned around and told you, that's still only allowing them to pull in $25,000. So obviously they're relying on a lot of fundraising 
<coughs> therefore, a lot more volunteers on. So, I, I just a comparison for you folks from another county. The other, the third other department thing. covers both counties that are on the line. They do some work in Richmond County yeah, yeah. and some in Inverness. So right. that's yeah. why Paul is very knowledgeable on the Richmond yeah. County side of it more than I am. The other thing that we can look at, but we have to be very careful, obviously, and deal with our constituents, is changing that tax rate, too. To bring in. That, that's one way of bringing in some more revenue, not all you need, probably, but. In the areas that have a uh, half-decent tax base, it would, but I'll, I'll go back to you for a second where you said Pleasant Bay and, and, and uh, St. George. Joseph Des Moines, where maybe adding two cents on the hundred is not going to bring you in a whole pile of money. Because if you don't have, now bringing it into an area that has a lot of commercial area, sure, sure it would bring you in some coin. But, and I'm not dismissing what you're saying by no means, but it may not be the so save all to we've seen is, uh, I've seen it recently, <coughs> the going rate yep. um, so that created a little more revenue for the people in that community yep. oh and anything by all means yep. and when not that's I'm saying we can't look at this other stuff as well yeah. but there's different ways we can look at it. baby steps is what we say we'll yeah. any kind of help we can get we'll yeah, gladly we'll take it, yeah. you know uh, and that's why we, we brought up the dry hydrant thing yeah, ting. oh god where am I from <laughs> <laughs> We brought up the dry hydrant issue because uh, we really pushed this in, in Richmond County. Uh, and I don't know how many of you follow what went on in Richmond, but their emergency services coordinator put out a report last week, two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, I guess, uh, pushing all this back on the fire service. Yeah. And as Paul said, uh, you train once a week, <coughs> you have a meeting once a month, mm -hmm. you do a half a dozen calls some weeks, yeah. uh, you do maintenance on your building, maintenance on you work a full-time job, and you have a family sitting at home. And then if you have a moose stuck in the arbor, they call the fire department. Anything. <laughs> that's what I heard the fire department. And that's what I said in one of the last things. 20 years ago, as the old saying goes, we put wet stuff on red stuff. That's, you, you put water on a fire. Now it's vehicle extrications, there's you know, people doing medical first response, and it, it, it was really an eye-opener, and everyone has seen some of the media coverage of how fire departments now, people have died, and they can see the fire department out the window, and they're not responding anymore because of COVID, but it gives you an importance of what the fire department does in a lot of areas that people don't know, because one of the biggest things when I took over as fire chief six years ago in Port Hastings, one of the first questions I was asked is if I was going to quit my job because I'm fire chief now. The general public, most of them do not know that they forget one word on the door of the truck. Yeah. <coughs> That's the big one. You know, they see the port, and I'll use my own, they see Port Hastings Fire Department, but that one V word is always omitted. Right? And we are volunteers. That's what it is. We do have families. We do have jobs, right? We, we do have lives. I was on the Inverness Department for 15 years. So I don't have to tell you, right? Councillor Gillis, would like to ask a question? Okay, so I just have a couple of things here. Um, I just did a quick calculation of how many fire departments are in the district are in place. So you mentioned there's 28 mm -hmm. in, your, in your total. In the total, our associate. So I just did a quick calculation. So if I don't include Inverness and like Ainsley, yeah. I still have eight, which is almost a third. If I include them, yeah. because they would respond to Mabu if Mabu had to come. Oh, to oh absolutely. Yeah. So you know, you're looking at a third of your <coughs> your straight air mutual aid is yeah. in Inverness yeah. County. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how many pagers would you have per department, would you say? One per member, and that's yeah. depending on how many members are in your department. I have about 25 pagers, because you have a few. As you replace them, you keep the old ones as a spare in case exactly. something goes wrong. So on an average, you could probably say 25. And like I say, like if you look at, I believe, Port Hawkesbury has 40 members, so yeah. they'd be looking at, say, 45 or yeah. 50 pagers they have. So on an average, <coughs> I don't know, I guess you could sum it up as 30 per department as a guesstimate is the yeah. best of it. You know, you'd have your members plus. So there's no paid firemen. Like put do they have paid firemen? No. There's well, nobody, well, in, our, no, nobody in our nobody in our association. In the, in the County or in the not not in our association, association. period. No. no, no, it's all strictly volunteer. Uh, in general, I think they have. They're not a full paid department. They have one person on staff. That's it. Which one? Uh, no, any the uh, town. Anish. Yeah, none of the county does. Uh, I think the next nearest one would be New Glasgow. Yeah. On a regular year, how much fundraising would you get? You know. In, in my department, yeah, it, it fluctuates. We've we've had bingos that we've made eighty thousand dollars a year. We've yeah. had bingos that we've made thirty. 
That's right. And it depends on prizes. It depends on weather. It depends on crowds. It depends. Yeah. It's a very what if. Whether the mill is open or not. <laughs> yeah. That's right. you know, when the area goes through uh, bad financial times. It's hard to raise right money. And, and even the amount of money that people spend when they come in, if they have a pocket full of, I shouldn't say a pocket full of money, but no. if everything is good, they may come in and spend $50. Hours, yeah. hours went south, went south, went out the door. Yes. So a lot of them did. You know, we were very lucky, and i got to say, yeah. but that also puts another night yeah. on that we got to do that. Yeah. Right? So there's, you're training, you're meeting, and now there's every Thursday night for a bingo as well. It's like two years. You know? Yeah, Dr. Gillis has another question. Yeah, I'm ready to answer. Uh, do you know how many dry hydrants you have No, we, we, I did send out an email back when we presented for Richmond, uh, and I did send it to our whole association. There is not many. Uh, I can tell you there was a couple. Uh, I'd be guessing most. If there's a half a dozen, I'd probably be cutting off a few fingers, really. Yeah. I think it's, it's more than exaggerating it. And not all of them are operational either. And then we have to know we just have to yeah. build the sidewalk clearing. So they'll be done within 24 hours. Yeah, after a storm event. Yeah. That is music to my ears. It is. It's mine too. <laughs> it's, uh, that, it's, it's always, tonight. and I can tell you, because we've had a fire a year and a half ago, mm. where, and I'll use the name, it was at Norvon Enterprises, and thank heavens that they had equipment there, because I couldn't access the nearest hydro. <coughs> it was five feet, and I did go after transportation for that, because it was their fault, because the way they plowed the road, they buried a hydro every time because it's on a bad turn and they bring the snow in there, but still, if it wouldn't have been them with they having the machinery right there. Yeah, clean it. Yep. It'd be a different story. Yep. <coughs> so that, that's good to hear. We'll just get them a little bit wider and we'll, you know, a little bit working area around them. We'll work on that, but that's great to hear. That's good news. Yeah. That's definitely good news. I, I, I'd like to, for our group to consider, you know, helping with this pager stuff, because I chat with Melody and we were looking through the gas tax. <coughs> And I can say that's a, guess, a guesstimate at the best so far. We're, we are waiting on still some, what's the best way to put it? The, the, the machinery to, or the gear to come in, and we're going to save some money doing it because the guy that runs our dispatch center is the guy that does the work on all our gear. He, oh, he fixes okay. our mobile radios. Um, so he is going to get a lot of gear and piece it together himself, which is probably going to save us 40 to 50% by him doing the work for us rather than just ordering the equipment to come in ready to be installed. So. That 70 is a guesstimate at the best of it right now. Because I did get the, the, uh, the forms uh, you know, from the county, and we have nothing concrete yet. The only thing we have concrete is that Seaside is on board to help us now, and that uh, we have an approximate idea of what this is going to cost. So. One other question, and then we have to move on to our final presenter. But I'd like to ask, is EMO fund any of this stuff for you? No. no. Our, our sole funding is, that's it. Yeah, no search and rescue or No, search and rescue was out on their own right now. Yeah, you know, there's nothing. Our mutual aid association uh, survives on a fee that we charge each fire department every year. You pay your dues to our mutual aid association, and what that dues go, goes for is we have to have that air bank. We had mentioned twice a year that has to be inspected by a certified company. We have some air bottles that we use as spares if a fire department uses them and they need some spare ones. Uh, we have some and repairs and upgrades to our paging system. Okay. So that's how our association is funded. Well, on behalf of council, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. We got a little bit over time, but it was a good conversation. And well, we appreciate and the invite. Thank you for your service, sir. We, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Add it all up, there's probably several hundred years of service there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a few for sure. There's a few. No, we do thank you for letting us uh, come down and speak to you. And we will take under advisement what you and at any time you want us to come back, we're a phone call away. You know, we're, we're, we're pretty easy to find. Yeah. Thank you for your... Thank, thank you kindly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Good to see everyone. And congratulations. And honestly, after 10 years there, I know what you're up against. And I commend you. And I respect. Don't ask for anybody. Don't mind. Don't mind. Sleeping better these nights, I take it a little quieter. I do when I wake up. Got 15 minutes. Not that fit, my stomach. Given what happened with the last two presenters, we may have to over two minutes. Yeah. I'm going to go fast. So two quick stories about my life in Cape Breton. So 40 years ago, I moved here, and it didn't matter what home I went to. And John, you would know yeah. the Gillis area. I'd go on the McFarlands and the McKinnons to the Gillis' yeah. house. And someone was there, tea was on, grandma was home, someone's upstairs. That was life, right? Family, 7, 10, 12. 
buses full of people everywhere. Right. That was the norm. It's not the same now, is it? And the that second story, second story is um, in 2008 there was a murder in Inverness, and it was one of the uh, elderly um, people in the community, and it was like five in the morning, and it was six young people, and. The six young people were people that I kind of knew on and off. I had been a foster parent, done work with them. And the story in the community was, at the gas station was like, well, they always were bad kids. And the other one was like, how come that happens in our community? So it was like one trying to blame them like they always were bad kids. And then neighbors of those kids said they were always the best kids. Yeah. Well, I'm saying Francis and Viola were neighbors of them. But I'm just sort of saying, so the story of early childhood is complex and the changes in our community are happening fast. So Raising the Villages is, uh, is one of the responses that we've been working on uh, at the municipality. Now I've taken it on outside the municipality. And the Mi'kmaq translation is Maui Omi Jit Mijiwajik, translates to gathering for our children. We've translated this uh, recognition into four languages, uh, Acadian or French, uh, Mi'kmaq in English, and uh, Gaelic. And we're located in Mi'kmaq, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and through reason the villages, my only Jit Mijiwajik, we're weaving back together our lives from our infants to our elders and from across all cultures to deepen our respect and understanding of each other, which is, that's our call to action. So the political imperative of why this is now, why is this now? So the Ivany Commission, everyone remembers the Ivany Commission. You know, it's John Bragg, a bunch of other people, uh, Susanna Fuller, who came from Bedeck. And they took a look at what's going on in the province because the economy is going down, population is going down, we're in trouble. And so they wrote a whole big report, and they never once mentioned this early childhood. But the coalition that came out of the Ivany Commission was 15 people, three political leaders, lots of people from business. They studied it for a year and a half. Where was the best investment to make if you want to change the business of Nova Scotia? It was early childhood. <coughs> Then they asked, in their report, no one really passes this around, but they asked communities to create projects designed to support and encourage the welcoming of Nova Scotia's children by engaging <coughs> parents and families to find out what that means. We did that here, 2017. This municipality was the leader in that. And we asked what was working and what more was needed, and it was the same thing. What's working is when you gather together, services are there, you needed more of it, because it was like two hours a week, or it was you know, once a month. And so then they asked us to build pilots around that. This is in 2016. And they asked us to base it on a First Nations narrative. So why did they come up with the early years? Why? Why? Because for 20 years, for 20 years, the early years has been proven it starts early. In utero. In utero. In the first year. It doesn't start at school. That's not early childhood. So when you look at this cascading uh, graph where the developmental milestones hit, and you can see some are starting actually right at birth, meaning they're happening in utero. Vision, hearing are happening in utero. A hundred billion neurons a human being is born with. A hundred billion neurons create a trillion connections by the time they're three. By the time they're three, before preschool, before pre-primary, before child cares. So early childhood is early. Early, early, early. And we know that if we don't have the healthiest beginning, the most connected beginning, going back to 40 years ago when grandma was home and everyone was around and people were holding and loving babies, Aaron's family's one, just saying, there was a lot of neural connections around language, touch, all the senses. And if that's not there, the biggest thing is neglect. What shows up in that first decade with those five, six young people that ended up in that murder case, they weren't doing well in school. They entered school with stress. ADHD was a part of the complexity. And it's not a blame of parents. And it's not a blame of school systems. It's shining a light on what we've lost in communities. It's shining a light on the connective community, the attachment community that we've lost. And if you go through life with early childhood that was vulnerable, it shows up throughout life in a shorter lifespan. Bottom line is, it's costing our society billions right now. Billions of dollars. Mental health problems, unemployability, welfare, all of these costs are complicating our bottom line to run a government. And yet we put so little upstream, we put so little. So this uh, Nobel economist from Chicago did the calculation. He said you get $8 back for every dollar you spend in early childhood. Early, like that first 18 months. After that, it starts to go down. By the time you hit school, for every dollar you're putting in, you're getting 50 cents back. 
And if you're chasing downstream poverty, if you're chasing downstream mental health, you are spending thousands on each individual. So why wouldn't we do this? Why wouldn't we do this now? And if you look at why wouldn't you do this, connect conception to six months, six months to birth, where are the place young women, young families can find out what is the amazing story that they're going to get into and in having their baby, where we can have nutrition support upstream. If there's not enough food in a family, let's give them food. It doesn't have to be a food bank. It can be a dignified place where we're, hey, take some food home this week. Creating lactation consults and nutrition support, pediatricians, connecting to intergenerational relationships. If we create those welcoming spaces to connect and belong from conception right through, I think what you create is the space to create citizens. And we were just having Charlotte and I having a conversation out there. It starts from feeling safe and belonging, and then it grows into a toddler who can take you things. And it grows into the three-year-old who can actually help out. And the four-year-old, that's where citizenship starts. And it's the easiest place to imagine why wouldn't you create a center like that. And so the mom's life is taken care of, the family's life is taken care of, and it includes all of us. And ask yourself this, if you set up an elementary school, would you set the kind of primary in one building and then put the grade one in another building across town and then put the grade two over here? Because that's what this looks like. When you think of early childhood in our communities, it's not a one-stop shop. It's all over the place. And so we're working at Raising the Village as we're trying to create a model across the whole region that encompasses universality. So in every community, there would be a Raising the Villages hub that's coordinated and open in Shetty Camp, in Marguerite, in Inverness, in Wicogama, in Port Hood, Mabu, down in, in Port Hawkesbury, and Badette. And we're working across the region, and I've just included, uh, talked with them, uh, Warden Mumberkett, and we're going to include Richmond County, because rural communities really deserve this. So the four things that Raising the Village has established is that we want to create welcoming community spaces. We want to work as First Nations, uh, as treaty people to recognize our First Nations as partners on this journey. The three things we can do to make this happen are coordinating, networking, and communicating. And we keep the community decision making at the community level. We don't let the provincial government tell us how to do this. This has got to be ours. And so that declaration was signed. So this is the timeline. Started in 2016 after I got elected. Had four years to do this. We met down at the uh, Bear Head Room or the uh, the Shannon room down in Port Hawkesbury had a group of 30 or 40 leaders and from all municipalities, First Nations. We said, yeah, let's work on this. We looked at what's working and what more is needed. Uh, we signed the declaration, including the wardens and the mayor and the First Nations chiefs. In 2019, uh, gatherings with welcoming and younger citizens were held across the region. We looked at starting an early years coalition. We held two meetings here last year uh, when I was still councillor. Uh, that didn't take off, so now we're creating a cooperative. So this idea that we create these welcoming spaces, you guys have a copy of this. You can reduce poverty at the source. You can reduce, instead of trying to reduce poverty everywhere else, you can have one place where that youngest citizen's got food, the comfort of a safe place, access to all the resources they need, a language-rich environment. You can be, create that, reducing mental health for the family. I just talked about crime. Literacy, employability, it all happens upstream. Connect to local transit, food, housing, which thankfully, you know, this county and our regions created a lot of those connectivity so we can utilize them. Strength in language and culture, in other words, most uh, of the strength of our culture comes from people being spoken to people, not from iPads, unfortunately. And business readiness will be in business. So the mission is to create these hubs in every community where there's prenatal onwards, support services are there, and nutrition, inclusive, welcoming, it's coordinated, full day, full year options for child care, and it's part of a regional network. So we move from this patchwork in silos where it looks like that in our communities. The government will never figure it out at the provincial level. They'll never work as a whole of government. They can't. They have to work in health and education. It's not a blame. It's what they are. But let's get it, the whole of community figured out. So our business community understands where early childhood is something we can invest in. That our health department understands that health of the infant is as important as education. And we do this with the policy going up to the province. Our municipality can become an advocate for saying, hey, let's fund that center that's going in Marguerite. Hey, our municipality believes that early childhood is one of the things that creates a more welcoming community for our business community. 
hey, this is where we can make a difference on childhood poverty. So this idea that we've created a co-op, I've just signed up uh, six people to uh, form this co-op. And I thought a co-op was the best way because everyone can join. Five bucks, everyone in. And maybe it's a political statement if you get 1,000 members. It's multi-sectoral. And we're there for the health of our communities. And so we start out with this message to do this. We want to raise awareness of the importance of the early years. Everyone can do that. Our municipality can be a team leader on messaging around that with Carolyn. She's the best at the communication. <laughs> we can help facilitate development of welcoming community spaces and hubs. We can advocate for the policy change to fund those. We can, as treaty people, <coughs> continue to foster the learning with our First Nations. What's going on there? What can we learn from them? And to provide that network connecting and communicating and advocacy for the regional services in our communities. Pediatricians come to us versus we go to Andy Ganesh, for instance. We've done that long enough. And to share and learn from what's happening across our region province. So who needs to be involved? Everybody. It's everybody's job. If it takes a village to raise a child, should we not be back in the game? So let's think about these centers of a place, not just for families with young children, but for our elders, for people to drop in after school, for, right, for people to be adolescents, to be partners in the development of their community. And so it's a place of giving back. And I think the idea that this is our time here after the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic, is a time of recognizing that we've all lost a lot. We've all suffered from the isolation. And we can't even stop at the co-op and talk and shop. So then maybe this is the time for us. And we've got uh, our first model will probably be in, in the deck because if you just saw the announcement, some business people had just bought the Kidston Landing Building to put a center in like this. And I'm meeting with the board. I've already met with them a number of times. And we got $10,000 from the health board over there to kind of kickstart that. So, we just want to get a model up so we can show the evidence is there. This works for communities, this works for families. This makes our place more business ready. An attractive place for people to stay and to come to. That's my pitch. I think I was pretty good. I think I was actually good. <laughs> 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 Not bad, eh? I, just, I, I celebrate being yeah, on time. Just a, a comment. Um, I had a recent call. An acquaintance actually used to sit on the municipal airport committee with his name is Adam Hart. He's a lawyer in the deck. He and his wife were instrumental in taking over the old fire hall and getting a daycare center yep. in there. From what he told me, they're going to be opening it up an office in the new building in Inverness there by the bridge. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. You know, the, the nice little big building is there. A law office, and she's in charge of the county. They have two young children. But he was asking what the interest would be in, in working towards helping with children and opening up the daycare and that. He'd be Adam Hartsburg. No, I, I know him. You know him? Yeah, I know him. Okay. Know him He'd be a good good guy to talk to as a volunteer for this program, I think. I think he'd be good on the board. It's good to have a lawyer on the yeah, board as long as they don't get in the way. Yeah, in the count. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, That's a good hot tip. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, would, uh, I would suggest you maybe make some contact. There, I will. He seemed really interested. And he's really interested in moving his business in the Ernest County way. So, thank um, you for that. Yeah, so that's just a, a, a line to some, some interest there. Just what I needed to hear. Actually. <laughs> I have a comment. Sure. I, go next. Um, I think it's a very important program. As you know, I've worked with children over the years and, and done a lot of programs on the national level as well as locally. And uh, it all starts in the womb. And I'll tell you, when these, these days are really tough on a lot of people, I, I can tell you formula insecurity with a lot of moms that are like literally being shamed mm. because they can't provide, you know, formula until mm -hmm. the next, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's free at a lot of offices that they went in, you know, doctor's offices or hospitals and they feel shamed going to get that and there has to be a place for that for you know help guidance totally right? parent to parent, parent friends to parent. meeting people no, talking. no judgment no judgment right you know doors and, open and it's so needed it's totally. really needed yeah and you 
food insecurity, but just like if we're talking babies, right? You know what I mean? But then we start to go along with food insecurity. Absolutely true. Absolutely. Thanks, Deputy. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions or comments or thoughts? No. What can we do to help these agents? That's so, the question. So the question, <laughs> question will be, you, this, look, this county's been number one in helping us get to this point. Um, we've held the funding for Raising the Villages. But just when we launched the co-op, we'll be looking for some seed money to launch the co-op that I want to match. I'm talking to the United Way right now. And I've actually, Emily Lutz, who's the counselor from Annapolis, who's the president of the, UN, of the NSFM. I just, I, I met with her this week and I'm meeting again tomorrow, but we're going to try and get it in front of the province. That the province would match the funds to help the coordination so there's two positions in the co-op, communication and coordination, right? Network development and coordinating what BIDEC needs. So you advocate back up. So I will forward a proposal to the municipality outlining what that co-op's role will be and what we can contribute to that as a municipality. Signing on is the big thing. Recognizing it in some of our, on our website, recognizing early childhood or, you know, creating more welcoming communities for our youngest citizens that includes our communities. Messaging will be important. Do you have a way on your website to join for the, have you got a $5 fee yet? It's coming. Okay. <laughs> I, just got Kenneth, I just got Kenneth McKenzie signed up. We just have a, uh, 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 yeah. And we have uh, someone from uh, Jordan's uh, principal, they're from Wagoma. And uh, you just gave me a couple more names. I have uh, a woman from Port Hawkesbury. So next week, because of the COVID, I'm going to drive around getting them to sign the official documents. I would say by April, but I'll forward something to you before that just to give you something to consider in your uh, deliberations Perfect. at council. Perfect. This was mostly information and celebration. Yeah. Like this, okay. yeah. this staff and this council has been one of the most supportive of the work mm -hmm. um, that we undertook here. And so. Never think of just for some fundraising, do a little fund these days or something for it? I think so. Yeah. First, I mean, we'll get five bucks from everybody, so yeah, five that, times 13, <laughs> that'll give us $60,000. Some of these funds go funding days raise yeah. terrific money. Yeah. I know. We've seen in recent days yeah. with uh, some people with health issues in my community and in Inverness and stuff. You know, they're, they're, so this will be a long journey for us, and I'm just asking the province to step up now. Yeah. If the province asks us to do this, we need to get the province to step up. That's why I'm talking to the NSFM. It's a, not everybody needs to do this at once, but we need to start shaping a different welcoming community. And you know that the partnership is working on welcoming communities for immigrants. This works for everyone. This works for everybody in our community. Immigrant family, you know, family that's been there intergenerationally had a hard time. It doesn't matter. That welcoming space needs to feel like it's welcoming. So we just had a Zoom call meeting today with the minister. Uh, for municipal affairs. Chuck? No, no. McGuire. McGuire. Oh, okay. Brendan McGuire. Oh, Brendan, Brandon. right, right, yeah. right. Very young, personable guy, very open to hearing suggestions and thoughts and, and cool. programs, um, and seemed to be very accessible. So, and the deputy minister was on his another Zoom call last <coughs> night with him, uh, the uh, number of, uh, as their CAO and I attended. And, uh, yeah. And he, he was, no, that was the assistant then. Oh, was it assistant? Yeah. But anyway, um, and a number of the staff there are from Cape Breton. So I think there's a real open door new, there. It might be timing, right? Yeah. And this minister timing. seems really open to hearing programs like yours and sounds like the kind of person you could get a, a sit down with even. Um, and we could maybe help with that. That would be good. It would be good. Like we're a team. Yeah. Right. We're a team here. Mm -hmm. And your model in Bedeck, that would be wonderful, Jim, to have them when we can go, visually see. One can go and, and kick the tires on. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's very promising. Yeah. That's a huge big building there. It's a huge building and a huge commitment from the business community mm -hmm. to do this. It's a legacy mm -hmm. piece, right? Mm -hmm. Not a big return on investment to them, but for the whole community, well, it's a big return on investment. Yeah. The center of that village will be full of people with the child care, the <coughs> library, and this center on the main street. It's kind of exciting. It's going to attract people to that community. It's exciting. Very much so. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I just want to comment after working with council to continue with this and this with this enthusiasm is really credible. <laughs>
for you to continue that to passion, and I, I, I really respect that. So thank, thank you. you. Really. Thank you. Onwards, everyone. All the best. Good <laughs> to see you. And you were fast. And you were yeah. quick. He knows the drill. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, one more item and then a motion to adjourn. Oh, okay. No, yeah. no, we have an in-camera item. Oh, do we? Yeah. yeah. Oh. We want just a quick recess to clear the room. Okay. Yeah. Okay.